Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through the Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. We are on part four. Today we are covering chapter 11 to 15 and somebody might talk about chapter 16 as well. So let's start with, it's going to be Rob, Maritza, Sherry, Rupali, Joya, and Iris to start things off. Um, all right, let's uh, go with Rob. Rob, the floor is all yours. Okay. All right. So actually today I'm going to, I have a few things I want to talk about, about a, a, a novella written by Ayn Rand called Anthem. Now I know this is the Fountainhead meetup, so why am I talking about <laughs> another book she wrote? Well, this is a book she wrote. Um, this is the book she wrote. It's, it's called Anthem. It's a short sort of science fiction uh, novel, uh, very slim volume that she wrote in 1937. Now, 1937 is right after the publication of We the Living, which is her sort of more autobiographical novel about uh, uh, young people trying to survive in Soviet Russia uh, based on her experiences uh, from the 20s. And uh, she had, that had just been published in 1936. She had begun research for The Fountainhead. And while doing the research for The Fountainhead, she hadn't really begun writing The Fountainhead yet, but she'd begun her research. While she was doing that research, she took a break to write this, this short story, Anthem. And apparently, according to one of the things I read, that it, it's something she, a concept that she'd had in mind for a story uh, since she was a teenager back in, in, in Soviet Russia. Uh, and the, so I'm gonna just, this, this little novella she does, it's right in the, the part where she's doing the research, she's preparing for the Fountainhead, it's, really focus on a lot of the same issues. And so the section we're getting into not right now, which is, uh, you know, chapters 11, 11 through 15, it contains a lot more uh, explicit philosophical material, a lot more, you know, he has this long, it's not quite a speech, but it's this long conversation with, uh, Rourke has this long conversation with uh, Gail Winans about the nature of a second-hander. Uh, and then, you know, a couple chapters later, Ellsworth Tui has this long confession that he gives to, to Peter Keating. And so we're getting a lot more explicit philosophical content about the themes of the novel. And Anthem was something that she wrote in part to work through some of those philosophical themes with a much simpler story. Um, so it, I think it's, it's highly relevant because it shows what issues she was thinking through as she was preparing and, and, and getting the themes right for The Fountainhead. Uh, now, Anthem, like I said, is 1937. Uh, it, it give you, I'll give you a brief uh, overview. It's, it's about- More spoilers? I'll try to give as few spoilers as possible in this one. Uh, it's about a uh, sort of world in the indefinite future uh, where everybody lives in these sort of planned collectivist communities. And the big premise of Anthem is that the word I has been driven out of existence. It is unknown and unused. Everybody uses the word we, right? So there's no concept. There's the concept of the individual, you know, not just individualism, but the very concept of the individual as such has been uh, exterminated. And so the our hero is uh, is named Equality Seven Two Five Two One. So it's the idea that everybody has like this little slogan or catchphrase and a number in place of a name. People didn't even have names. They're all just numbers. They're all thoroughly collectivized. And uh, the uh, the word I has been outlawed. Everybody uses we. And it's this totally planned and regimented community where you know, a certain limited number of people and they all live, all the men, all the, 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 uh, the street sweeps, a street sweeper. All the street sweepers live in this dormitory with a hundred beds in it. And they all go at certain predetermined times to a, a meal hall and then to, you know, every aspect of life is totally regimented. It's all done collectively. It's all done as a group with other people. And uh, our, our hero wanted to be a scientist. The, uh, the, the scientists of this ideal future, by the way, um, their, their big um, achievement in, in recent, their most recent big achievement was reinventing the candle. And <laughs> it gives you an idea oh. of the technological, <coughs> the technological level we're dealing with here. 
And, but you know, it took them hundreds of years to invent the candle because it all had to be done by committee, right? Because nothing is done by an individual, everything's done by a collective. So there's this vast committee and it took them many years to, you know, to, to be sure of developing that they really wanted to develop and how they were gonna do it to make sure it was adopted equally across the entire world and all these little utopian planned communities. So this is her, you know, again, working through these issues of how the individual works versus how the collective works. And um, I, without spoiling anything, I'll say that, you know, this, our main character goes off on his own Ooh. and does things by himself and comes up with inventions and discoveries. And that's what drives the plot. But you can see that she's really working through this issue of what is the role of the individual in a society? Uh, and specifically, what is the, what is the, role of the self versus the group or the collective. Um, now, interestingly enough that I want to mention that I have to read a little excerpt from uh, uh, from a part of the end of the uh, of Anthem to give you an idea of of, uh, of of how she deals with the issue there. But I want to make a point that, you know, when she's sort of projecting this future utopian community where it's everything's planned and regimented and everybody lives in these sort of cadres of a hundred people. And, and all of that is, is, is partly based on her Soviet experience. And in fact, uh, people have mentioned uh, parallels between this and uh, a book written in 1920 or 20, 1920 to 21, a book called We by Yevgeny Zamyatin. So it's a, a Soviet, you know, early years of the Soviet Union, somebody writing this uh, sort of science fiction thing about a future in which, uh, uh, which the individual doesn't exist. You didn't uh, need that pen. Did I didn't you? actually need the pen, so I'm okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, extravagant gestures, and there goes the pen. Uh, and so this was something that was, you know, around in the culture, but it wasn't just in the Soviet Union. Uh, there's this long, I'll, I'll just throw that one away too. Uh, there's this long history, especially throughout the 19th century of these utopian communities and this idea of a planned community where everybody you know lives in groups of 100 they, they like groups of you know these round numbers like we're all you know that the ideal size of a community is 10,000 people so we're gonna have the whole world planned of these communities of only 10,000 people and you know the ideal group within that is a group of 100 and you're going to do things all together in a group of 100 there's going to be a big meal hall where you all eat your meals together now, Sherry didn't have time to pull this up, but no, she sorry. years ago she gave a lecture where she talked about, you know, in, in talking about the development of architecture in the 19th century and some of the ideas that would lead to modernism. One of the people who came up with this was a, a, was a Violet Ledoux, a, a French architect, who came up with these plans for the architecture for, and, and he wasn't the only one. I mean, Le, Le Corbusier did it and all sorts everybody of- Everybody did it. Yeah, everybody, basically in the early, in the 19th century to the early 20th century, practically everybody did this of coming up with an ideal community, a perfectly planned community, and all the architects had their plans for how they would do this. And the, the signature of this kind of architecture is you have one big building where everybody goes at a certain point in time to do the exact same thing, right? <laughs> you, know, you have one big dining hall where uh, the meal is served communally to everybody who lives there. Um, uh, I think in Viola Ledoux even has a, a house of pleasure, basically a, a, a city run brothel where again, you, you know, whole, it's, it's there as a public service to the whole community. All the, it, it, you know, there's some stuff that really gets crazy about this, but it's this idea of that regimented collectivized society was all the rage. And in fact, um, I did some research a while back about, I was trying to look up the origin of, of the word individualism. Where did the word come from? Because you go back to the Enlightenment philosophers, you go to the, the founding fathers of the United States, you know, they, these were guys who were advocates of individual rights. They never described themselves as individualists because the word didn't really exist. And I found that at least in English, its origin is from the 1820s uh, among a group called the Owenites. And the Owenites were, they were actually bankrolled by a guy named Owen who had uh, made, Robert Owen, who had made this a, a fortune in the Industrial Revolution in, in England. But he was enamored with these sort of, you know, utopian ideals. So they, they formed a community in New Harmony, Indiana. They actually took over, there was an existing like religious commune there that moved on and they took over the, the property. And they formed one of these the ideal collectivist communes where everybody's going to, you know, work essentially, you know, uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And this went through the life cycle that most of these communities have. Uh, about three, at about three years, the whole thing collapsed and, and there's, 
bitter acrimony and everybody's blaming everybody else. Uh, but you know, there were all these attempts in these small cell communities to come up with a perfect collectivist altruist society. And uh, that what was interesting to me on that about the reason I, I came, I was looking into that is because the, o, the Owenites and New Harmony are credited with the first use of the word individualism, which they came up with as a pejorative to be the opposite of what they stood for. Uh, and there was one guy who was involved with the Owenites, and I think his name is James L. Chama Smith. He's not really well known after the 19th century, but he was like the one guy who came out of this who said, wait a minute, we have it all wrong. Uh, in trying to get rid of individuals, and that was our mistake, we should embrace individuals. Now, he had crackpot ideas on economics. He was still kind of a socialist, but he was the, like the one person who came out of it realizing that, wait a minute, the we need individual effort. We need individual ideas. We need individual um, uh, motivation in order to make everything work. We shouldn't be trying to suppress it. We should be trying to, uh, uh, to unleash it. Uh, so he was sort of partly responsible for individualism going from being a purely pejorative term to then having a more positive. Did uh, I lose your page? Yeah, probably. Beginning of chapter 14. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Uh, so it shows that, you know, that when she's talking in, in Anthem, when she's showing this ideal uh, collectivist society that was based on, very directly on, this phenomenon that have been going on for more than 100 years of people trying to create these regimented ideal collectivist communities in which individualism would be stamped out. Uh, and so then, you know, in, in, in writing Anthem, she's then answering that and talking about the, the importance of the individual. So a couple of small excerpts, so a little mini speech at the end of Anthem uh, in the voice of the hero uh, after he's discovered the word I. This is the big thing he's been trying to figure out the whole time. He's discovered the word I. And he says, I'll just do two short excerpts to give you an idea of the, how the themes that she's developing here uh, feed into the fountainhead. So one is, I know that happiness is possible to me on, on earth and my happiness needs no higher aim to vindicate it. My happiness is not the means to any end. It is the end. It is its own goal. It is its own purpose. And this should remind us of uh, uh, of Gavin Wynand uh, and the one the scene we talked about last week where he's saying, you know, I've committed every sin there is except the most important one, which is uh, seeking validation outside of myself for something. And then later on, it says, he says, for the word we must never be spoken, save by one's choice and as a second thought. This word must never be placed first within man's soul, else it becomes a monster the root of all evils on earth, the root of man's torture by men and of an unspeakable lie. All right, so here we have the, the we being made first in a man's soul is what we've been exploring, what she's been exploring with the, uh, especially with Peter Keating and with um, uh, Ellsworth Tui and the Fountainhead. And so Els we're gonna about to go to Ellsworth Tui's, we have in this section we're talking about today, we have Ellsworth Tui's speech where we see about this, the idea of the word we being first in the soul and then becoming a monster that, that, that destroys people. Um, now, so those issues that she was dealing with in Anthem were preparing her for Atlas Shrugged and now, you know, preparing her for the Fountainhead. And now, you know, some, what, where are we? We're about- You're on page you know, we're like 600, roughly 600 pages into the Fountainhead. We've had all the story and all the history of these characters and we're really ready to start sort of bringing those themes out more explicitly. And so we get two little mini speeches in here. We get Howard Rourke talking to Gail Wynand about the nature of a second-hander. Um, and we've been, he's been, we've been dealing all along with this idea of what is the self uh, and what does it mean to be selfish? And Peter Keating has put forward throughout all of this as the conventional view of what it means for someone to be selfish. He's a conniving, he's climbing the ladder, he blackmails people, he's dishonest, he leaves a girl at the altar in order to make a, a marriage he considers to be more advantageous. He is the total conventional caricature of what it means to be selfish. Well, here's what uh, Rourke says about him. And this is after meeting Peter and, and you know seeing basically the, the pathetic remains of Peter uh, on, and as he's sliding on his way down. So Rourke says, it's what I couldn't understand about people for a long time. They have no self. They live within others. They live secondhand. Look at Peter Keating. 
I've looked at him, at what's left of him, and it's helped me to understand. He's paying the price of wondering for what sin and telling himself he's been too selfish. In what act or thought of his has there ever been a self? What was his aim in life? Greatness in other people's eyes. Fame, admiration, envy, all that which comes from others. Others dictated his convictions, which he did not hold, but he was satisfied that others believed he held them. Others were his motive power and his prime concern. He didn't want to be great, but to be thought great. He didn't want to build, but to be admired as a builder. He borrowed from others in order to make an impression on others. There is your actual selfless, selflessness. It's his ego that he's betrayed and given up, but everybody calls him selfish. Isn't that the root of every despicable action? Not selfishness, but precisely the absence of a self. Look at them. The man who cheats and lies, but preserves a respectable front. He knows himself to be dishonest, but others think he's honest, and he derives his self-respect from that second hand. The man who takes credit for an achievement, which is not his own. He knows himself to be mediocre, but he's great in the eyes of others. The frustrated wretch who professes love for the inferior and clings to those less endowed in order to establish his own superiority by comparison. They're second-handers. So that's where he gets to the idea of second-hand. They're getting all of reality is coming to them. Their, their sense of value, their self -worth, sense of worth, their purpose in life, it's all coming second-hand through others. Um, but he also goes to talk about that what is the, so if the self is what Peter King has been giving up, giving up what is the root of the self? So he says a little bit, just a little bit later, what would happen to the world without those who do think, work, produce? Those are the egoists. You don't think through another man's brain and you don't work through another's hands. When you suspend your faculty of independent judgment, you suspend consciousness. To stop consciousness is to stop life. So the root, and this is a, a, another major theme of Ayn Rand's work, the root of the self is your mind, the independent mind, your ability to think. And I like the line to, when you suspend your faculty of independent judgment, you suspend, you suspend consciousness. So in a way, you know, that's where, that's how Peter King is making himself, uh, uh, making himself selfless is that he's literally destroying the self uh, by making, he's destroying his consciousness in the act of not using it and surrendering it to somebody else. Uh, now, the other th issue I wanted to bring out here is then she also, uh, uh, through Howard Rourke, she also brings up here the issue of altruism. Now, I'm going to remind you here, because it comes up in, in uh, Tui's speech, too, that altruism is being used here in its very direct, full, completely consistent sense, the but taken from the origin of the, the, the guy who originated the term, August Comte, which is the idea that you live for others, vive pour altrui. You live for others, that literally other people are the purpose for every single thing you do in your life. And not only that you, uh, you know, that you live for others some of the time, but that you literally have no thought and that it's the, the, the sin in his sort of secular uh, religion that he created. The sin, the biggest sin was to, was to take any regard for your own well-being or your own uh, interests and everything should be done for the sake of others. So it's, it's the pure sort of distilled essence of selflessness. Um, so he says, let's see. After centuries of being pounded with the doctrine that altruism is the ultimate ideal, men have accepted it in the only way it could be accepted, by seeking self-esteem through others, by living secondhand. It has become a dreadful form of selfishness, which a truly selfish man couldn't have conceived. And now to cure a world perishing from selflessness, we're asked to destroy the self. Uh, he says, uh, and I, there's a line here that uh, I really like where he says, uh, he can, let's see, that, that the man who has been, who has absorbed this altruist ideology, quote, he can't say about a single thing, this is what I wanted because I wanted it, not because it made my neighbors gape at me. Then he wonders why he's unhappy. All right, so, uh, This, all of this is, is a setup, is setting up. So we got, we get a lot of this insight on altruism and of the nature of the self from Rourke. And then we get, we get it from the other most 
uh, insightful observer, <laughs> which is the bad guy, Ellsworth Tui. And this is a scene where he comes to Keating's apartment to find out what's going on with mm -hmm. the, to get the real story about Cortland, uh, ring it out of Peter. And he gives this speech, this sort of confession. Uh, he says, I can never say this, you know, to anyone publicly, so I'm going to say it. Uh, but now, you know, Pete, basically Keating's enough of a wreck. He's been destroyed enough that he feels it. <coughs> he can say it to him. Uh, let's see. And at the bottom, he, he's talking, so he gives this long discussion about how all the different ways he's seeking power and all the different techniques for seeking power. And he comes, brings up altruism again. Kill integrity by internal corruption. Use it against itself. Direct it toward a goal destructive of all integrity. Preach selflessness. Tell man that he must live for others. Tell man that altruism is the ideal. Not a single one of them has ever achieved it and not a single one ever will. His every living instinct screams against it. But don't you see what you accomplish? Man realizes that he's incapable of what he's accepted as the noblest virtue, and it gives him a sense of guilt, of sin, of his own basic unworthiness. Since the supreme ideal is beyond his grasp, he gives up eventually all ideals, all aspirations, all sense of his personal value. He feels himself obliged to preach what he can't practice, but one can't be good halfway or honest approximately. To preserve one's integrity is a hard battle. Why preserve that which one knows to be corrupt already? His soul gives up its self-respect. You've got him. He'll obey. So he, he, you know, he's talking about the role of altruism in the sense of living for others as being something that's literally impossible for someone to do. So therefore, it breaks down. Uh, it, you know, it, it's a moral. It's it's something preaches a moral ideal. It has the effect of breaking down morality in people's minds. Um, but also, he talks about the the um, the psychology of altruism versus, uh, versus self, self-interest or pursuit of happiness. So he, we talked, when, when we looked at, 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 um, at Tui's sort of biography, his past history, he talks about how, you know, the happy, uh, the, the, the self-confident kids at school didn't need him. It was the sad sacks and the losers at school who needed him. So you see how this, he's made this into a philosophy of life. And then here's how he's describing it here. This is the most important. Don't allow men to be happy. Happiness is self-contained and self-sufficient. Happy men have no time and no use for you. Happy men are free men. So kill their joy in living. Take away from them whatever is dear or important to them. Never let them have what they want. Make them feel that the mere fact of a personal desire is evil. Bring them to a state where saying I want is no longer a, human, a natural right, but a shameful admission. Altruism is of great help in this. Unhappy men will come to you. They'll need you. They'll come for consolation, for support, for escape. Nature allows no vacuum. Empty man's soul and the space is your, and the space is yours to fill. Um, and then the last, one of the most interesting aspects of this too is, is the uh, interchangeability of doctrines. This is the, the mm -hmm. thing that's really fascinating about uh, about Tui's speech in its historical context, because this is, you know, the 1930s, early 40s, the Red Decade. This is really, but also this is very much the time when a year in the European context where the choice was fascism versus communism, where you had these two things that were supposedly totally opposite ideologies. And, you know, George Orwell in the late 40s, George Orwell would write things like Animal Farm and especially 1984 where he would sort of, you know, his big breakthrough, I think seeing this and when he was in the 30s, he was in the Spanish Civil War, where it was a, com a battle between fascists and communists. And he, that was where he observed that functionally there was so little difference between the two doctrines. Well, Ayn Rand is exploring the same theme a few years earlier uh, and put it into, um, uh, puts it into Tui's speech. So he has several points where he says, you know, you, uh, you don't have to be too clear about it. Use big, vague words, universal harmony, eternal spirit, divine purpose, nirvana, paradise, racial supremacy, the dictatorship of the proletariat. So he's saying, you know, all these different ideologies, the religious ideologies, the communist ideology, the fascist ideology, they're all kind of interchangeable because they're all trying to achieve, they're, you know, underneath all the details of the theories and the words that are used, they're actually the same. And a couple of pages later, 
He says, uh, he says, you have to, there has to be something above reason. He says, you don't have to be too clear about it either. The field's inexhaustible. Instinct, feeling, revelation, divine intuition, dialectical materialism. So he's, you know, if there's religion and there's socialism and they're all, there's Marxism and they're all one thing. And he makes that even clearer uh, towards the end of the speech where he says, look at Europe, you fool. Can't you see past the guff and recognize the essence? One country is dedicated to the proposition that man has no rights, that the collective is all. The individual held as evil, the mass as God. No motive and no virtue permitted except that of service to the proletariat. That's one version. Here's another. A country dedicated to the proposition that man has no rights, that the state is all. The individual held as evil, the race as God. No motive and no virtue permitted except that of service to the race. Am I raving or is this the cold reality of two continents already? Mm -hmm. Watch the pincer movement. You're sick of one version, we push you into the other. We get you coming and going. We've closed the doors, we've fixed the coin. Heads collectivism and tails collectivism. Fight the doctrine which slaughters the individual with the doctrine which slaughters the individual. Give up your soul to a council or give it up to a leader, but give it up, give it up, give it up. My technique, Peter. Offer poison as food and poison as antidote. Go fancy on the trimmings, but hang on to the main objective. Um, so, you know, that's something that was, you know, really radical and way ahead of the time, uh, circa 1938, 39, when, you know, 1940, when she was writing this. Um, and that most interesting aspect of it, uh, the last interesting aspect that I wanted to highlight is where Tui says that, uh, talks about his own role in all of this. Uh, 75, okay. Uh, now, if you were a little more intelligent, like your ex-wife, for instance, you'd ask, what of us, the rulers? What of me, Ellsworth Monkton Tui? And I'd say, yes, you're right. I'll achieve no more than you will. I'll have no purpose save to keep you contented, to lie, to flatter you, to praise you, to inflate your vanity, to make speeches about the people and the common good. Peter, my poor old friend, I'm the most selfless man you've ever known. I have less independence than you, whom I just forced to sell your soul. And he has a great line about how we'll have all subject, we'll have universal slavery without even the dignity of a master. So, you know, in the, in the ideal collectivist future, the leader is the biggest follower of all. Um, so, you know, you can see how she's, she's developed all these themes throughout here of what is the self uh, and what is the nature of the self? What is the nature of selfishness? And she's really developing the whole theory and bringing it out to the forefront and all of the implications of it, uh, including the idea that the, the self is fundamentally, it's your, it's your ability to think independently. That, that's the fundamental aspect of the self. And then talking about what fills the gap uh, when, you, when you use the philosophy of altruism to destroy the self, how that causes it to, uh, causes the individual to become emptied out to become hollow and destroyed. And then what fills the gap when that happens? Uh, but literarily, the interesting thing that I, the thing I found interesting is, um, and I'm trying to make it, I, I, I didn't quite have time to find exactly where this is, but where is he says that he's, uh, we well, he asked him to read Faust. It's in the beginning of his, of his, Right here. Oh, there he is. Where Peter Keating says to Tui, leave me alone. He says, too late, Petey. Ever read Faust? <laughs> so Faust is a reference to famous play by Goethe about a man selling his soul to the devil. And that's essentially, you know, the interesting thing is that Tui is, he is Mephistopheles in this. He is the man who has gotten people to sell his soul to him. And the interesting thing I was thinking about this, that the interesting thing about various versions of the Mephistopheles myth is that generally speaking, what happens when you sell your soul to the devil is he gives you, he, he complies literally with the terms of the deal and gives you what you ask for, but always in a way that twists it and makes it so that you lose in the end. Uh, there's a lot, it's all sorts of different versions of this. There's, uh, I mean, there's an old Twilight Zone episode where the guy uh, wishes for, uh, the guy, uh, he finds a, a guy running an old antique shop, finds a lamp. And a genie comes out of the lamp and gives him three wishes, right? 
And he asks the first wish, he says, I want, I want a million dollars. And he gets a million dollars and he gives it away to his friends. He buys all these things. And then the tax man shows up mm -hmm. and he suddenly has to, you know, the taxes were way higher back then. The uh, percentage, the marginal tax rates were way higher back then. So he has to give a whole bunch of it back uh, and ends up with less than he had before. Uh, so then he says, oh, oh I, what I want is I want, ab I, I want something. Nobody can take anything from me. I want absolute power. And the genie gives it to him. He has absolute power and he's Hitler in his bunker. You know, in the final days of World War II, he has absolute power and everything's coming crashing down. So that's what the deal with the devil always does. He gives you literally what you want, but in a way that uh, uh, he complies technically with the terms of the deal, but in a way that makes you miserable. And that's what Tui is in here. Is he's not, you know, he, he, he gives Peter Keating everything he, he nominally, he supposedly wants, but knowing that in actuality, he's taking away all the things he actually really wants. And that is, and, and, and his, and it is destroying him. So that's Tui as Mephistopheles following that great literary tradition of the deal with the devil, where every time you make a deal with the devil, no matter if you know, he'll, he'll comply with the technical terms, but you're still going to lose. Uh, so I thought that's interesting how she ties in to that whole literary history there. And that's my stuff for today. All right. So me the creeps. What gives you the creeps? <laughs> Reading that speech by Tui. I'll oh, yeah. Well, yeah. He gets such glee out of it, too. It's very odd. Yeah. Um, well, hi, guys. So I am going to continue on this theme here. So that's, I suspect that's going to be the theme for the day. Um, you know, selfishness, altruism, and um, what we mean by those and what we're being shown by um, Ayn Rand. So you know, like I like to remind you guys, The Fountainhead is a work of fiction. It is a very cleverly and beautifully written work of fiction. However, Ayn Rand does have many philosophical works in addition to her fiction books. Um, and I have been mentioning over the last few weeks, I've brought up little snippets from The Virtue of Selfishness, which is a collection of many of her essays on her philosophy, specifically addressing the terms of selfishness, um, altruism and the like. What I actually would like to do here is go and speak just a little bit more in depth about her concept of the virtue of selfishness. And I'll be drawn heavily from um, her collection of essays there and she's under titled The Virtue of Selfishness. Um, first, I'd like to say that, you know, when she's talking about individualism versus collectivism, you know, she is talking about in regards to a man's soul, not, you know, politics, necessarily, even though in The Fountainhead it comes out as um, political in nature, because that's the best way to paint the scenery for us. We're talking about something like deeper here, yes? And the interesting thing here, I took and I did a comparison of the two speeches that we have here um, split in these five chapters. In chapter 11, we get Rourke's speech, well, it's not a speech, but his conversation with Wynand when they're on the yacht, and then in chapter 14, we get um, Tui's, and it's definitely a speech that he um, tells um, Keating. And I did a comparison to them because they're talking about similar concepts, but on op opposing sides. And that was kind of fascinating to me. Um, and also, and this concept of selfishness. So, you know, when we look at, um, I have a whole bunch of notes here. Let me uh, pull up. So, so in other things that we've been viewing, we do call the self consciousness. So, if we're talking about this consciousness, we're we're, we're equating that to the self. And so, when we're when we're talking about this idea of you know having no self, you have no consciousness. You have no reason. And so that's kind of terrifying. So I'm I'm gonna tease that a little bit, that concept. Uh, so in um, the introduction of the virtue of selfishness, Ayn Rand tells us that since nature does not provide man with an automatic form of survival, and since he has to support his life by his own effort, the doctrine that concern with one's own interests is evil means that man's desire to live is evil, that man's life as such is evil. No doctrine could be more evil than that. What are we saying here? We're saying that if we believe 
that it's evil to support our ability to live, to have a desire to live, then we ourselves are espousing evil. And that's really, really very strong to hear. But this is what she means. You know, so many people's ears close up the second you tell them that selfishness is important and necessary in one's lives. I have all of my life dealt with that, people saying that. Um, but obviously, Ayn Rand probably did as well. But here's the thing. This right here, this phrase is what she's saying to us. This is what she means when she says to tell people that they must only ever think of others and never think of themselves. You're telling them they must never have the desire to live. And that having such a desire is evil. But that's impossible. That's in our nature. That's an evolutionary trait this will survive, right? We are human beings with a consciousness and our conscious self wants to live. It just does. And so what she's saying here is, you know, she says, no doctrine could be more evil than that. And then the next line she says, and yet that is the meaning of altruism. She says that altruism holds death as its ultimate goal and standard of value. And so when she's vilifying selfishness and altruism, before closing your ears, remember the definitions. Remember what it is she's saying that she's vilifying. She's vilifying the holding of death as an ultimate value and a goal here. So, um, when Vork and Wynan are speaking in the yacht, they're talking about selflessness and the ego. And Gail is talking about how he erased his own ego. He says, I erased my ego out of existence in a way never achieved by any saint. Why? Because a saint will only sacrifice material things. I sacrificed my whole soul. I kept those material things and I gave the world my soul. The fascinating thing about Wynan is that he's very well, and both Wynan and Tui, by the way, they both are very much aware of what they're doing. Wynan acknowledges that he gave away his soul and he's okay with it. Um, Tui acknowledges that he's collecting souls and he's certainly okay with it. Wynan says, I wanted power over a collective soul and I got it. And you know, he says, I've sold myself, but I've held no illusions about it. So he willingly, willfully gave up his self, his, his soul, as it were. And um, when we're talking about selfishness, you have this, it, it's, it's not quite a speech, but work barely speaks for paragraphs at a time. But in this conversation with Wynan, he does. And he's telling us, you know, actual selfishness is destroying the world. Actual selfishness, not, not the concept that's held as this beautiful thing where all you ever do is think of others. Because let's remember, we're human beings. If all you ever do is think of other people, what are you forgetting? The self. And that's not sustainable and it's not good for us. So that's what he's telling us. You know, he's saying that when you look at the mess that Keating has become, Keating is not sure how he's become this mess. He thinks he's this mess because he's been too selfish in life. But Rourke asks us to wonder, in what act or thought of Peter's was, has there ever been a self? Others dictated his convictions. He didn't want to be great, but to be thought great. And that's, that's basically it's his ego that he's destroyed and what he's given up. So his self is what he gave up because he wanted to be considered great. And, you know, Gail points out, well, this is a pattern that most people do follow. And that's kind of scary, but the retort that we get is, 
And isn't the absence of a self the root of every despicable action? And that's really one that, that we just, it causes us to ponder, but then you get the answer because Tui is telling us yes. Tui is saying yes. And not only is that the case, but you can use that to break people's souls purposefully. Um, so Rob read for you guys a piece of a quote. I want to add the last sentence. It's on page 607. And to me, this is so huge. I might say it twice. So when you suspend your faculty of independent judgment, you suspend consciousness. I'll remind you guys that consciousness is yourself, your ego, your I. So when you suspend your faculty of independent judgment, you suspend consciousness. To suspend consciousness is to stop life. To suspend consciousness is to stop life. Every time I read that line, it gives me chills. It is a reminder that every time we stop actively, intentionally moving forward in our lives, we're not actually living. So second-handers have no self of reality. Well, because if they don't have a consciousness, they're not really living, right? So how could they possibly have a concept of reality? So these second-handers are men without an eye. And they're also not open to reason because if you don't have any concept of what is reality, how can you have the ability to reason? And so that, that's the argument that Rourke is making for why selfishness is something that's, it's killing the world. You know, he says it's destroying the world. And I wanna go back to the virtue of selfishness essays. So Ayn Rand tells us that the psychological results of altruism may be observed in the fact that a great many people are approach the subject of ethics by taking such questions as, should one risk one's life to help a man who is drowning, trapped in a fire, stepping in front of a speeding truck, hanging by his fingernails over an abyss? So these type of questions, right? And he said, she says, consider the implications of that approach. If a man accepts the ethics of altruism, he suffers from the following consequences. And these are in proportionate to the degree of his acceptance, right? Lack of self-esteem, lack of respect for others, a nightmare view of existence, lethargic indifference to ethics. So the lack of self-esteem is because if your first concern has to be not how to save your life, not how to live your life, but how to sacrifice it, how can you possibly have a good self-esteem if you're if you believe that you're supposed to be negating your life, if you think that mankind is doomed and everybody needs to be helped, how can you respect them? And the, the thing about the, this psychological view of altruism is that you'll think that it's a malevolent universe and you would all of your actions would stem from that premise of an, a malevolent universe. So that's kind of a nightmare view of existence, right? And then the last one, the, the worst is that lethargic indifference to ethics, that's, that's an amorality. It's like a cynical amorality because you are disconnected from this moral principles because you, you are told that the, the, the primary has to be this altruistic view of only helping others and never looking to you know, increase or uphold the eye. Uh, and that's, so, so that's her view on altruism there. And that translates back to exactly what Tui is saying because he brings in the word mediocrity, which you know, I brought up a little bit last week and you know, I called it his merry band of mediocrities. And here, there's nothing merry about the way in which 
Tui uses the word mediocrity. He's telling us that this is the way that you beat down people. The way that you destroy people is not by telling them not to look at great things or not to and notice, or don't even try to destroy the great things necessarily. You take away their ability to recognize the great. Make everything mediocre and everyone will be lost. That's, you know, the Cliff Notes version, right? Um, but he starts before, I mean, he totally eviscerates. I mean, he eviscerates Peter in this speech. And the saddest part is it's not from a desire to eviscerate Peter. It's just from a desire to have somebody hear his reasonings. And he knows he won't be able to make that speech for anyone else. And he thinks so little of Peter that he's going to put all this word vomit onto Peter. And he starts by telling him, you know, it's amusing to me that the one you loved, you destroyed, and the one you hated, you followed. And he's talking of Rourke and himself. And he has an ugly moment before he goes into his speech, which I think is really telling. Before he goes into his big, long diatribe, diabolical, I can almost like see him rubbing his fingers together. Before he, he goes into that speech, he says something which I think is really interesting. And I think there's that little bit of ugly resides in anyone who's trying to force people to reject any greatness. He talks about the fact that he wants work to end up in jail. And his reasoning for wanting work to end up in jail is because he'll have to take orders. And he and it's the way it's written, again, brilliant literary writing here. The way it's written, what he's he's doing is it, he seems almost like. He's, his voice is like the way I read it, I can't help reading it and envisioning him with his voice escalating and his eyes getting all big and maniacal and his like fists, his hands going into fists because that's the way it's written. Um, and what it is, is that he wants this one person who has the ability to achieve greatness, to be pounded into submission. And it really truly irks him that he has not been able to do so. And so now he's hoping, or not hoping, he's wanting the um, government to do it for him through the jail system. But it's so ugly a sentiment. It's like, I need to see someone who's striving for greatness downtrodden. I need them to be stepped upon, like need it. That's the view that we get from him. It's really ugly. But then the nice thing about seeing that, if there's any nice about it, is that you're not as shocked or horrified as you're reading his speech because you saw his true nature in that hysterical rant about work, being in jail and having to take orders. Which again, brilliant, brilliant writing because she gives us his emotional sentiment in that little tiny paragraph rant. And then he spends three pages, you know, as Pinky in the Brain on top of the world. Um, so that, but he's telling us again, the idea of, he's talking about the soul, right? And he says, the soul cannot be killed. You can't kill it. You have to break it. Drive a wedge into it. Get your finger into it. And then the man is yours. If you kill a man's sense of values, his capacity to recognize greatness or to achieve it, then he's yours, right? He says, then you have absolute dominion and power over him. He says, enshrine mediocrity and the shrines are raised. So if you don't like a temple, if you don't like a religion, if you don't like a movement, don't try to go against the movement necessarily. Kill somebody's ability to recognize that movement as great and the movement will crumble. And that's very chilling. Kill reverence and you've killed the hero in man. That's terrifying because we, we all need to have heroic moments. It's again, it's that whole concept of 
without the eye, you cannot do so many other things. You need that eye. Without the eye, you just cannot move forward in so many things. If we look at Srikant's motto, it's that inverted eye is what Tui is talking about here. This lack of having a, an individual thought. I really like um, the, the way that Rob pointed that out for us, you know, this idea of just the collective and the, the kind of scary implication that that means. But even Tui tells us that man has, they do have a weapon against you. If you're somebody who's trying to collect their soul and you're trying to enshrine mediocrity, they have a weapon and the weapon is reason. And he does give a, a reference to an octopus, I will say. I think it's inaccurate. I mean, octopus are supposedly super intelligent. So to say that they only have legs and no head, it's, it's kind of rude. But anyway, um, he uses the word bromide. It's not a word that you would encounter very often in your day-to-day. -day. Basically, what it means is something that's trite, unoriginal, and he's equating that to what he thinks we should be, which is horrifying. What I find to be pure evil is something he actually does say. And it's, it, it aligns perfectly with Wark's statement that to suspend consciousness is to stop life, right? And so what Tui tells us is that he says, let progress stop. Let all stagnate. There's equality in stagnation. All subjected to the will of all. He, that's his idea of nirvana. And that's horrifying. You guys have heard me often saying that I believe that without forward movement, we're lost. The way towards improving ourselves, towards improving our communities and our culture is to keep walking that meaningful path. If you find yourself off, go find that spot again, right? And also it's the idea of how you have to improve the eye. Hold the eye strongly, nurture it, feed it. And that's the best way to improve the community and the culture. This is the exact opposite. He's saying there's equality and stagnation. So technically he's correct. Sure, there is equality and stagnation we're all equally doomed, basically. Um, and it's, it's a very chilling thought to think of anyone holding that as a philosophy. And what Ayn Rand is pointing out to us that when we uphold altruism as the primary value, you know what falls out? This center, I, as primary. It has to be pushed out because altruism is telling you, you have to put others first. And we've already discussed, if you do that, how can you hold the eye tightly as you move forward? You cannot. And this is why she calls it evil. She uses the word evil, which is a very, very strong statement, but understandably so. And so there are two passages that I, I go back to here in looking at these, these two, um, concepts that we're talking of, you know, selfishness, altruism. On page 330, we're told by Tui, again, another little mini speech of his, he says, only when you learn to deny your ego completely, only then will you achieve the greatness which I have always expected of you. So now we fast forward closer to the, towards the end of the book, and what he's saying to Peter is you've achieved this. You're, you're my biggest success story. So what he's saying to Peter is that you have so completely denied your ego that I, a power hungry collector of souls, find you to be my, my success story. And that's kind of horrifying. Another thing he, he says, um, and this is just, this one's just a little bit earlier. It is on page 595. He says, I don't believe in individualism, Peter. I don't believe that one man has any one thing which, or is any one thing which anyone else can't be. I believe we're all equal 
and interchangeable. What a dull world indeed it would be if we were all equal and interchangeable. I think that that is a gross inadequacy in the statement of human beings in general. Um, we are not so very many in this room here, virtual room here today, and yet not a one of us is interchangeable from the other. Every person, bring, every being brings in something different. We're all reading the same book. And even that, we're, we are performing a collective action together, but we're all reading it, understanding it, digesting it, taking from it slightly different things. And that being the case, how can we possibly be interchangeable? Because every small little thing, even if it's a tiny kernel that triggers a memory from your childhood, and you share that memory with someone else and somebody else is like, I never considered that, or what a beautiful story. Now you've, you've impacted someone else's life. How could you possibly be interchangeable with someone else? It's, it's not possible. And so to me, you know, that's the, the good thing about seeing Tui's speech here is that we're shown what not to be. Let us ensure that we don't drift. Let us remember that the self is the ego, is our consciousness. And let's hold on to that. Because if we don't, we end up stagnant. And then you're right where the twoies of the world want you. And, you know, again, there's this idea of or this, this statement here, to suspend consciousness is to stop life. I have had some history where I had, I call it my two lost years, right? To get myself out of that and to move forward, I just woke up one day and wrote a little piece on a little piece of paper, surviving is not living. And I taped it up in the mirror in the bathroom. So every day when I went in, because you know, we all go into the bathroom every day. It's impossible, you know, you can't skip that in the first world, right? I saw that. And every day I read that, and that propelled me towards just one step in front of the other to rebuild because the Maritza that was died. And I was not working on resurrecting even a semblance of my eye. And I didn't even, didn't even realize it. It took two years and someone, some external um, um, event for me to realize that I was just floating. I was not living. Um, and so when I realized it, I wrote that note it was the first thing I did, the very first thing I did. And then I started slowly working myself back into the world of the living. And that's the way I think of it, that I had to work myself back into the world of the living. And why? Because I wasn't consciously doing anything. And so I was not truly alive. And so when you guys hear me talking about, let's keep walking on that meaningful path, forward movement is the way towards improvement. I believe that with every fiber of my being. And and I think it's so easy, especially in today's modern world. It's so very easy to be floating and not floating along and evading and just not really doing anything without being aware of it. Um, and you can accidentally become a second handler. When we see Tui and Wynand, these are examples of two people who are very much aware of what they're doing. They, they're not evading. So then there's, that's like the other thing. It's like, okay, so now I've got it in my mind. I'm not going to evade. So what do I do to ensure that I don't go to that path? A thought here is, so I started putting one step in front of the other, but I started working on myself. If I had focused all of my energy on others without taking the time to focus on myself, 
So let's remember that what I'm saying was the Maritza that was died. If I didn't recreate a new Maritza or a new version of a Maritza, and all I did was worry about making sure everyone else was happy or I was giving everything to everyone else, what, where would I be? I would not be who I am here today. And I think that's, that's the cautionary tale that we're being shown here. In all this word vomit from Tui, what you're getting is the evil that can happen within oneself if one is not attentive. So if we don't take control of our consciousness and we don't move forward with purpose, someone else is gonna take control of your consciousness for you. And you may move forward, you may move sideways, but you're probably gonna not move at all and only think you're moving. And then one day you're gonna wake up and realize that there are these like puppet strings very, very firmly attached to your soul. And you will be as sad and miserable as Peter Keating. The, now these, these are two big main components that I did wanna talk about. I'm gonna spend like two seconds just to talk about, you know, that was chapters 11 and 14 for the most part. What we also see happening here in these chapters is the downfall of the banner. And it's not dead here. We're just seeing the trouble, right? The, tr the trouble with the banner and the crazy Herculean efforts that Wynan and Dominique are trying to take to save it. By the way, I will say these, these five chapters are the chapters in which I least respect Dominique. And I am very much in team Dominique for the most part. In these chapters, I have a very hard time with her actions because to me, I feel that they are um, dishonest. That's me personally. Um, and so I would be curious to hear others' thoughts on that. Perhaps maybe when we're done and we have our um, chat about the book entirely in general when we're done. But so basically what she's doing is she's decided that she's gonna be with Rourke, but she's still with, and, and I, I get the nuances and I understand, you know, for the this, uh, fiction purposes, it was necessary. But the, the, the thing here that, so I'm gonna set that to the side and Gail Wynand is a changed man. And it's heartbreaking to see that because He's trying now to put substance into the banner. But the banner is his baby that he created without substance. Remember, he, he, when he very first started, he showed them the picture of the, the pregnant lady and the sob story. And then he showed them the smut story and the smut story sold. And he told them, this is the kind of paper we're going to be, the smut story paper. Um, so now he's trying to walk that back. And we're watching the futility of it. it. It's a little bit sad to me because you do get the feeling that Ayn Rand thinks that redemption is not terribly feasible. I don't know if I agree with that, but that's that's what we're shown here in in those in that the downward spiral and the very freneticness of um, the um, wine and papers. And then it's just so heartbreaking when um, Gail goes and talks to Rourke and says, I am not helping you. Um, and he's realizing it. So you see, this is a second-hander who realizes that he wants to be a first-hander, but his current actions are just not going to get him there. Um, and I'm gonna stop there. Thank you guys. Um, and so I think next up was Sherry, right? Yep, yep. Um, thank you so much, Maritza. That was beautiful um, and very touching, um, your story. I wanted to start, um, I think I might answer a little bit the, your thoughts about Dominique, maybe, maybe. But I wanted to first, since everyone's talked about this so far, the 
TUI speech. Um, first, I have to thank Rob for not reading the TUI speech and the TUI voice because it gives me the creeps. It's a little bit of TUI. <laughs> but um, I want to tell a funny, or put a little funny spin on this a little bit. Um, we, of course, had read this book many, many times and we're very, very familiar with this TUI speech section about how to kill a man's soul. Um, before we ever had children. And so um, when, when that newborn comes into your life and um, you're, you have that, that sense as a, as, a, as a new parent that there's this little tiny bundle and, and, and all you worry about is, can I keep it alive? <laughs> you know, if you're not a parent, you don't understand this. But when that little thing comes and it's so tiny and so fragile, you literally say, Oh my God, it would be so fantastic if, if we can keep this thing alive for six months, you know? Um, well, that wears off, obviously. But um, the other thing that Rob and I had very deliberately said is that it's, yes, that part's important. You got to keep the child alive. The other part that's right close behind that is to not allow any of this kind of thing to happen. That child for its early days, you're cementing in that sense of life of what that child sees the world, how that child sees the world. And so it was something we talked about is, okay, yes, keep the baby alive, rule number one. Rule number two is not let that sense of life get tarnished. And so all of these things that you read here with Tui that just give me the creeps, you know, kill reverence, enshrine mediocrity, tie happiness to guilt, all of these things. These are things that can happen very, very simply um, with very young children. And um, the monos and I'm, I'm, I, I bet you that, that Rupali is gonna be talking about Montessori in this direction. <laughs> <laughs> but um, this was this is this is so easy, and, and it's little tiny things that can um, slowly erode that sense of life. And if you can keep that, okay. So one, keep the baby alive. Two, keep their sense of life alive, and then that's really a huge part of what you have to do in early childhood education and in parenting. Um, and so that's that's just, every time I read this speech now, that that joke between Rob and I, when, when I was pregnant, we were thinking of having kids before that, this was the conversation that we had. Um, and it's much better to think of little children and, and Tui speech than it is to <laughs> read that speech in the Tui voice. So, um, that was the first thing I wanted to talk about. The other thing I wanted to talk about here is we've talked about this a couple of times, this issue of color. And um, I know it's kind of, I mean, Fountainhead, let's talk about color. Um, but I, I really think that, that we've, we're hitting some serious pay dirt in these five chapters. Um, so I'm gonna take a couple minutes here to jump back. It's not just about color, but there's an illusion of a material I want to bring out that comes all the way through um, and, and pays off. And maybe Mirza, this will ex um, help explain. Um, this is about where I start to, I, I start to like Dominique because I think she's making connections here. So maybe this will tell me later, okay? Okay, so we started, or I started, um, I don't know how many weeks ago, talking about this blue green contrast. Um, and we talked about um, early on at um, when, when Dominique first meets Rourke in the, in the quarry where she's wearing this, these pale colors, these icy cold colors. And then we get the situation, the, we get the image of uh, that contrasted to Rourke's orange red hair. Um, and I wanted to bring us back to just a little bit of that to pull out a couple more details that will come up here. So we start here, it's way back on page 211. Um, 
And it's, it's, it's this description of fragility and glass. Uh, let me see if I can find it here. This is in that scene where, uh, oh, here we are. Thank you. I've got a pointer. <laughs> you do a highlight. It's highlighted, but I'm looking at all the underlining. Okay, so we're in the scene where I read this a little bit last week when I'm talking about one of my favorite scenes of, you know, this is, now it's broken. Now the stone is broken. Uh, just a little bit after he breaks the stone, um, we have this, this line. Dominique, we're referring to Dominique. She saw the shelf of her dressing table. It's glass edged like a narrow green satin ribbon. Um, it's this reference to glass that I want to point out here. So we talked about the color of glass before, and there's a couple um, chapters later, we actually get that. We get that color of glass, um, but we'll get to that in a second. The other section here is a bunch of five, six pages forward. This is after the Pasquale um, Orsini incident. That's my way of uh, putting it. We get another reference to glass when um, Rourke doesn't come back and fix the stone. He sends Pasquale instead. Uh, and then he visits her that night um, and takes her. Um, and there's this reference to, she's before he shows up, uh, she's at her dressing table, this glass top table, and she spills a drop of perfume that remain on the glass of the dressing table that drops sparkles like a gem. Um, it's these continuous references to this fragility and glass. So then we jump forward to, um, let's see what page here, I'm over here, 257. Oh, oh no, there's another one here, yeah. So Crystal, so as, um, as Rourke is, is taking her, um, she's knocking, he lamp, she grabs a, dressing, a lamp off the dressing table. He knocks the lamp out of her hand and the crystal bursts into pieces in the darkness. Um, there's another of that fragility glass reference. Um, and then of course he leaves, uh, she doesn't go to the quarry for three days. Um, and when she does finally arrive back at the quarry looking for him, he's gone. Of course, Enright finds him. And so he's left the city. And so she thinks she's never going to see him again. And then, of course, there's Kiki's party. <laughs> so here's Kiki's party. Um, Rourke knows he's going to see her there. She doesn't know who he is. So he comes in and we, we, we get this description first of Dominique wearing uh, this dress, uh, the color of glass. Again, there's that glass reference. Her evening gown, the color of glass. Um, and this is when Keating is standing with her and Keating says, in his mind, uh, the thought Keating has is, he had the feeling he should be able to see the wall behind her through her body. She seemed too fragile to exist. And the very fragility spoke of some frightening strength, which held her anchored to existence with a body insufficient for reality. So we've got that reference again. And then Rourke shows up at the party. He comes to meet her. They're introduced as if they don't know one another. Um, Rourke sees Dominique standing across the room. Um, Let's see. And he feels a violent pleasure because, and listen to this, she seemed too fragile to stand the brutality of what he was doing. What he's doing is just walking up to her in a public place and being introduced. Um, so it's, he's, he, she seemed too fragile to stand the brutality of what he was doing and because she stood it so well. So again, there's that reference to glass and fragile and breaking and also of strength at the same time. So what I find fascinating is that we get these drips. This is, remember, this is a work of art. So their details make a difference. And in a painting, if you had a color, and I think we talked about this once, 
when um, I, I had, I was, I was talking about a particular painting that had little drops of red color, just the little bits. And it causes your eye to catch that detail and follow it through the painting. Well, I think that these references to green, ice blue, and glass are something that we always see referenced to Dominique. We see that reference of the fragility of her very thin, slender body never being strong enough to handle reality. Um, <laughs> And then we get this storyline that shows how that is so not true, that she has the strength beyond, beyond anyone else. So then we have this storyline coming forward. And remember, we talked about this, where the color changes when she's, when she's in her relationship with Peter, everything is, she's always wearing gray. And when she's in her relationship with wine and everything's in super contrast in black and white. And so in this group of chapters, we've jumped forward, you know, 400 pages or so. Um, and we, we are at this scene where Rourke is gone on the yacht for three. By the way, if anyone wants, to, I'm pretty tired. So if anybody wants to take me out on a yacht for three months, I'll even cook, uh, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so he arrives back. And of course, why does why is he gone for three months? I don't know any architect who would be gone for three months in the middle of all their projects. But this has to happen because Cortland has to be built before he can notice what's happening, right? That has to happen for the plot. So he comes back three months on the yacht. And then we have this, 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 this visit where Rourke comes to meet Dominique. He's meeting her to talk about what his plans are to do with Cortland. And this meeting, we have her talking about, she comes there, he comes in and she thinks the most important never has to be said between us. It's always been like this. He did not want to see me alone. Now he's here. And then this very important line, I waited and I'm ready. So remember in these last sections of chapters, she's making those connections. She knows that there's like this final pin that needs to drop for her to really understand what she's doing wrong. Remember in her discussion with wine and we're making the same mistake. And she's not quite sure what it is. So she's waiting for that last pin to drop. And it's dropping in these chapters. In the same section, she talked, again, this is um, in Dominique's mind. It's as if his body contained two sets of, his, of nerves, his own and hers. And then the very next page, he had not wanted to name it. He had wanted her to understand and show no fear. Remember, it's the fear of him in the world that is the thing that's driving her to try to destroy. She had not been able to accept the starter trial. She had run from the dread of seeing him hurt by the world, but she had agreed to help him in this, had agreed in complete serenity. She was free and he knew it. And that's a really important part. He knew it. So then what happens is, of course, we have the, the scene at Cortland. She has run out of gas. Her car, here we are again, color, a black car, red leather. Remember, Ayn Rand writes in her treatise on fiction writing, um, the details of a work of art. There's nothing to begin with. Every detail you put in is important. She's also wearing a black dress, black silk dress. Um, she's often wearing silk or satin, which is a luxury, a tie to a luxury item, but it's also about the flow of it. And that'll come in a, in, in a, in a second here too. Um, then there's of course this crash of sound 
Um, and there's this reference to white crosses on black windows. Again, that ultimate contrast that happens. And then there's this detail, a blinding flash and the glass panes of the, of the skyscraper across the river glittered like spangles. That's really, really evocative description because here we are, this is a woman who lives in utter luxury. Spangles are what she would normally wear on one of her fanciest dresses, you know, all the, every breath she would take and the whole dress would sparkle, you know, think classic Hollywood, think, um, ooh, think of that dress that, um, in Fred and Ginger, what's the one particular movie she's wearing? Oh, that's the feather dress, Never mind. Yeah. Feather. sorry. Um, but there's this, this, it's not just glass now, it's now fragile, glass glittering like spangles. And then of course, she, she, has to, she has to be seen with that broken glass. So these handfuls of glass she puts over herself and then cuts herself with sharp splinters. And then there's this really important line. She was free. She was invulnerable. But we don't know here that she cut an artery. This is Dominique. Remember, what was it Winan says? If you ever were in love with, man, with someone, you would put him through hell. She has to take everything to the very, very end. That's her strength. And so we see her take this to literally the almost last breath of her life. But she's free. She's now not afraid of being in the world. And this is when the pay dirt happens. So of course she spends, we don't even know how much time she spends in the hospital or recovering back at home. But she's in chapter 13, recovering at home. And her bedroom is described as the bedroom seemed lacquered with light. It's the clarity of crystal over everything. And so here's where that reference to glass. Now we get this in a different way. It's the clarity of crystal. And that's really Dominique's thinking now has become that clear, that clear, like the clarity of crystal. Um, and then we have something quite interesting, and I don't know if any of you caught it. We've got this time, and I know Maritza is like, okay, she knows she wants to be with Roar. Why is she still with Wynand? Because Wynand needs to, to make his clarity too. He needs to get through that process but there's something really fun that happens. And I don't know if you caught it. Bottom of page 650. Wynan is in the fight for his life at the banner. The sun hit the square crystal inkstand on his desk. It made him think of a cool drink on a lawn, white clothes, the feel of grass under his bare elbows. He tried not to look at the gay glitter and went on writing. And I'll jump forward a little bit here. The door of his office opened without announcement. Dominique came in. She had not been allowed to enter the banner building since their marriage. He got up, a kind of quiet obedience in his movement, permitting himself no questions. She wore a coral linen suit. Does anybody know what color coral is? It's orange. So we have for the first time, and it's not, it's a very specific shade of orange. It's what I would describe as a feminine version of orange. It's orange with a little maybe touch of pink to it. So boom, we're no longer in black and white. 
like it's like Ayn Rand had this black and white movie version and she had this vision that all of a sudden it should crack into color at this scene in such a way that we can't help but realize she's made a major change in her thinking and it's now inevitable. It's just a matter of time. So that's mine for today. And who's next? I think, is it Rupali? Yes, Rupali is next okay. up. Sherry, that was wonderful. I was, um, you know, when I read the part about she was wearing a coral linen suit, I thought of you. And I was wondering if you would bring that up today. Rupali, so, um, I can't see you. Oh, just give me a second. Um, Sherry, I, I would say I'm yeah. shocked that you didn't read the um the line that the rest of the the that sentence there about the sunlight dancing in her folds. You're right, because I had folded the book back. You're right. I absolutely need to. Um, sorry, Rupali. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry, Rupali. Give me a second. Yes, she wore a coral linen suit. She stood as if the lake were behind her and the sunlight rose from the surface to the folds of her clothes. I also think it's really interesting that she's wearing linen because linen is my favorite fiber to wear in the summer because it is so light. Remember, that's the reference that we get when Wynan goes to see Rourke and comes back and she says, you look light. So, right, let, let's pass it to Rupal. Yeah, it's um, wonderfully uh, choreographed, I would say, in the scene. And um, these five chapters uh, in part four uh, are so packed and Maritza, Rob, both of you did a fantastic job explaining um, the various elements in these chapters. Uh, also in these chapters, Ayn Rand uh, expresses her philosophy through the characters, the actions and the words of all of the characters, whether it's secondhanders or the creators. Uh, and here we are coming to the climax of the book. Everything is set in motion. All the pieces are moving. Some are coming to a culmination and uh, some are kind of um, coming to fruition. For example, Dominique's journey is, is um, coming to a point of completion. So uh, this, these five chapters are really wonderful. And one of the things um, that I have focused on during this uh, uh, discussion of Fountainhead is the contrasts that Ayn Rand uh, brings about in every section. And so I'm going to focus on the contrasts uh, between Rourke and Keating. Part one starts with that. And um, year two, we see Whereas in part one, the question is who is successful? Is it Roark or Keating? And then here we actually come to a conclusion of that contrast. And uh, there's the, uh, the key contrast between uh, Roark and Tuhi, and that's the, the core of the philosophy, the meat of the philosophy, the individual versus the collective and uh, the individual spirit and the second-hand or spirit. I also, um, see the contrast between Tuhi and Wynan in this case, and the contrast of the idea of power that both men hold. Um, and then it uh, kind of culminates into the love between Dominique and Roark. Um, again, uh, as um, Sherry has pointed out, this, this whole journey between the two of them, and it's like I feel with Dominique, it just cannot be a straight even path. It has to be violent. It has to be dramatic. It has to have that element of drama to it. Uh, and then we have, you know, Gail Vinen and Keating attempting their fights. Um, 
and Keating just for the, uh, you know, the character that he is, um, his fight doesn't last long, fizzles out very quickly. And then Gail Winan has uh, a more of the self in him that he can hold on for a little bit longer. Uh, and can he survive that struggle? So that's what we see in this these chapters. The other interesting things that come to my mind um, are the idea of the union um, and the idea of self, when does that begin, right? So the idea of the union, uh, growing up in India with having a um, very close relationship with union leaders because they are part of the industrial um, fabric of India. And uh, it's very rare to find a factory that doesn't have a union. And the, you know, uh, where Dominique talks about it in uh, one of the chapters here that Gail, it's okay if they're talking about their salaries or things like that. But if it is not those elements, then why are these unions there? And, most industrialists, and I saw this even uh, very closely with my family, that unions are usually like, ah, don't worry, they're just noisy things, but then the power that they hold. So I um, thought that was very well explained in this chapter, uh, in this section. And then finally, I'd like to talk about the idea of the self, the idea of values. When do they start? And um, when, uh, Rohit and I had a son, we wrote uh, for ourselves, we wrote what is it that we wanted for him and why we wanted a Montessori education. And so every Montessori school we went to see, we kind of presented our um, thoughts about why we wanted it. And um, we were, you know, it was very interesting to see not all Montessori schools are alike and there's a variety and you have to find a Montessori school that actually aligns with your values. Um, but uh, it is so crucial that these values or these ideas uh, are nurtured when children are younger, because uh, when you bring them up with the idea that the collective is the norm and working towards an average is a norm, they actually start believing it when they are in college because that's the impressionable age. And if they don't discover Ayn Rand in college, then, oh boy, you know, help them. So, so I feel um, those are the uh, thoughts that I have about these sections, uh, this chap these chapters, and I'll focus on those. So I'll start with the contrast between Howard Rourke and Keating. The whole idea that Rourke has the idea of I, a very strong I, and Maritza, you talked about the idea of you know, uh, Keating's eye kind of where Dominic asks him uh, earlier in the book uh, where um, Keating and Dominic are having a conversation and uh, Keating says, you know, Dominic, you need to have an eye. And Dominic says, so Keating, Peter, where is your eye? And we see throughout the book that Peter sells his soul. He um, does not have a self um, he does not have a sense of self, whereas Rourke has this strong sense of self. And uh, he, Rourke is not willing to make compromises for uh, to, to get work, whereas Peter keeps making those compromises. And so by the end of the book, we can truly see that Peter is selfless and uh, Rourke's sense of self is uh, very clear. So then the question is, who is successful? Because that's how chapter, the part one starts off with Peter at the highest level of his career and Rourke in the bottom and the quarry. Uh, and so here we see uh, Peter's dwindling career uh, almost coming to an end. Let's see. Uh, Rourke, uh, says to Peter um, in, on page 611, he says, Peter, it's I who've destroyed you from the beginning by helping you. There, there are matters in, one, in which one must not ask uh, for help or give it. I shouldn't have done your projects at Stanton. I shouldn't have done the Cosmo 
Slotnik building, nor Kotlin. I loaded with you with more than you can carry. It's like an electric current too strong for the circuit. It blows the fuse. Now we'll both pay for it. It will be hard on you, but it'll be harder on me. And I think, you know, often as um, I feel that uh, when, sometimes I feel when I have um, people who ask, you know, who come for employment and then I say that, okay, maybe I can help them get to this level by coaching or mentoring or doing, but, if they don't have the drive, then whatever you do really doesn't help. It actually becomes a problem. And I see this in um, Rourke's conversation with Peter where he says that I've probably done more damage. Um, and so, um, so that's about Peter and uh, Rourke. Now, the contrast between Rourke and Tuhi, uh, I think, um, Rob spoke very well on this, the two monologues between, you know, uh, Rourke and um, Gail Wynan on the yacht where Gail talk, uh, where Rourke talks about what does it mean to be selfless and why is it important to have um, your own integrity? Whereas uh, what about, and then to he, um, talking to Keating and his monologue over there where he talks. Uh, so let me just highlight a few uh, things over there because the whole idea of individualism and the individual spirit is captured in uh, Rourke's speech. He says, um, Gail Wynan asks Rourke, why else? Uh, uh, he says, think of elsewhere to you. And, um, Rourke says, why else would to eat? I mean, the thing he's, he preaches, selflessness in the absolute sense. Um, and then Wynan goes on to say that that's who he has been, uh, that you know, if, if he really feels that um, somebody who does not have any uh, sense of what he's been, then he is a prime example. That's where also um, Rourke says that, okay, well, what is altruism? And that he is not an altruist. I don't decide for others. But then he goes on uh, to say, okay, he, he, he's paying the price. So now this is about Peter Keating. He's paying the price and wondering for what sin and telling himself that he's being too selfish. In what act or thought of his, of his has there ever been a self? What was his aim in life? Greatness in other people's life, in other people's eyes. Fame, admiration, envy, all which comes from others. Others dictated his convictions, which he did not hold, but was satisfied by others believe, what others believed he held them. Others were his motive powers and his prime concern. He didn't want to be great, but he wanted to be thought great. He didn't want to build but he wanted to be admired as a builder. He borrowed from others in order to make impression on others. There's your actual selflessness. It's his ego he's betrayed and given up, but everybody calls him selfish. And um, that, that whole dialogue, okay, so he goes on to say, the man whose sole aim is to make money. Now I don't see anything evil in a desire to make money, but money is only a means to some end. Uh, so that's um, if Ellsworth to he, I'd say, aren't you making out a case against selfishness? Aren't they all acting on a selfish motive to be noticed, liked, or admired? And that's by others at the price of their own self respect. So the, the question is, you know, how do they, how do people come to think for themselves? How can you have independent judgment uh, if you are constantly thinking about what is somebody else thinking of me? One of the things that I noticed, uh, we have, I, I, I've mentioned this before, this uh, student who's very unhappy at school. And the reason is he's always, 
getting a poll uh, from in the classroom about how he feels. Like it, it's like eight students in the classroom feel that I'm unhappy, and so I'm unhappy. Eight people or six people think that I should like uh, this activity, and therefore I'm going to do this activity. And it just like makes me think, where does this start? When does it start where you care so much about others that you don't think about yourself? Now, in um, the, the uh, other thing that um, Rourke talks about is, he says, you know, on page uh, six or seven, a stamp of approval, not his own. He can't say about a single thing. This is what I wanted because I wanted it, not because it made my neighbors gape at me. Then he wonders why he's unhappy. Every form of happiness is private. Our greatest moments are personal, self-motivated, not to be touched. And I think this is the sacred part about who an individual is and what really gives them joy, what really gives them satisfaction. Um, to see joy in meeting halls. We haven't even got a word for the quality, I mean, for the self-sufficiency of man's spirit. It's difficult to call it selfishness or egotism. The words that have been perverted, they've come to mean Peter Keating. Gail, I think the only cardinal evil on earth is that placing your prime concern within other men. I've always recognized it at once. And it's the only quality I respect in men. I choose my friends by that. And I know what it is, a self-sufficient ego. Nothing else matters. If one doesn't respect oneself, one can have neither love nor respect for others. Um, so starting with the self, uh, that's what one of the uh, things that uh, at our school we talk about respect. And it always starts with themselves. I'll come to that later. And do he, uh, we've seen him uh, talk about what he means by uh, his power and the, the idea of collective, collective, collectivism. He says, I inherited the fruit of their efforts. I shall be the one who'll see the great dream made real. I shall see it around me today. I recognize it. I don't like it. I don't expect to like it. Enjoyment is not my destiny. I shall find such satisfaction as my capacity uh, permits. I shall rule. And the thing is, who does he want to rule? He really just wants power for the sake of power. He, he whereas on, you know, Wineland, he at least has a reason for his power. It's not, a, it's only a matter of discovering the liver. If you learn how to rule one single man's soul, you can get the rest of mankind. It's the soul, Peter, the soul, not whips or swords or fires or, or guns. That's why the Caesars, Attilas, the Napoleons were fools and did not last. We will. The soul, Peter, is that which can't be ruled. It must be broken. Drive a wedge in, get your fingers on it, and the man is yours. So he goes on to say, not a single one of them has ever achieved it and not a single man will, will ever. Uh, so he's talking about altruism and doing things for others. Kill a, kill a man's sense of values, kill his capacity to recognize greatness or achieve it. Great men cannot be ruled. We don't want any great men. men. Don't deny the conception of greatness, destroy it from within. The great is the rare, the difficult, the exceptional. Set up standards of achievement open to all, to the least, to the most inept, and you stop the impetus to effort in all men, great or small. You stop all incentive to improvement, to excellence, to, per to perfection. Uh, and he goes on to say, I mean, this uh, entire monologue of uh, Ellsworth do he really captures uh, what Ayn Rand's philosophy is about collectivism and how that destroys mankind. Um, happiness is self-contained and self-sufficient. So Howard Rourke is talking about happiness that comes from individual action and the joy that it gives. Um, and Ellsworth too, he recognizes that. He says, don't allow men to be happy. Happiness is self-contained and self-sufficient. 
Happy men have no time and no use for you. Happy men are free men. So kill their joy in living. Take away from them whatever is de dear to them or important to them. Never let them have what they want. I want is no longer a natural right, but a shameful admission. So one of the things that growing up, um, I grew up in a very religious um, family. And you know, now that I'm reading the Bhagavad Gita, I can see the principles behind it and the principles about working towards yourself. Uh, but when it is all kind of uh, packaged in uh, religious, um, I would say religious traditions or um, dogmatic uh, practices, then it is just follow blindly and do things so that you are, and then there is no I want, there's no I would like to do it differently or questioning anyone. Uh, so she's really captured that very well in here where she says, you don't have to be clear about it either. The feels inexhaustible, instinct, feelings, revelation, divine intuition, dialectic, materialism. If you get caught at some point and somebody tells you that your doctrine doesn't make sense, you're ready for them. You tell him that there must there's something above sense. There, that here he must not try to think, he must feel, he must believe, suspend reason, and you play it. Again, uh, anything goes in that, any manner you wish, whenever you need it, you've got him. Can you rule a thinking man? We don't want thinking men. This is the world I want, a world of obedience and of unity, a world where the thought of each man will not be his own, but an attempt to guess the thought of the brain of his neighbor who will have no thought of his own, but an attempt to guess the thought of the next neighbor who will have no thought, and so on, all around the globe, since all must agree with all. So here, here are the two contrasting ideas where a man can think for himself and can create, and the other where people cannot think for themselves, humans cannot think for themselves, and so they are just following each other and what a mediocre world. I think in Atlas Shrug, she really takes this idea further. And uh, the, the blasting of the Cortland uh, housing, like I, I've always wondered how, what makes Rourke be so violent and kind of blast the, the housing complex. Um, and something that I feel is, you know, that was his creation, uh, which earlier in the, um, book we read about what Rourke's idea about integrity are, that the building that an uh, architect creates also reflects his own integrity. And now that his plans were uh, changed and uh, botched by all these other architects adding on their um, ideas, not staying true to the thought that he had created. So, uh, he makes sure that no nobody is hurt in that process. Um, but the whole idea that he wasn't going to let his, his building be compromised, his creation be compromised, his integrity being compromised. And we saw that early on in the book where he wasn't willing to uh, sell his soul and make compromises to just get a job. He was willing to go to the quarry and work, do a, a day laborer's job and give up architecture if he needed to, but not compromise. And so um, here is where, you know, um, this, this action of Rourke's kind of made me, for the first time when I read this book, I thought, wow, you can do this. You can actually stand up for your values. And it is a very dramatic statement here because he, he blows up the housing complex. Um, whereas, you know, uh, growing up in India, everybody does what, what's right in the society, what you follow what the traditions are, you kind of stick, you know, what will others think? What will others say? Um, but this was an instance where, you no, know, you can stand up for yourself in this world, here and now, you can take action for yourself and that's okay. I think that was what came 
um, it became very clear to me um, as uh, a young uh, adult when I first read the book. And then, uh, of course, you know, Atlas Shrugged, I think, just takes it further where uh, the creators then leave the world to the second handers. And we've seen this happen in parts of the world where uh, in Africa, um, where uh, when uh, Idi Amin took over and all the creators were asked to leave the country or were uh, banished and, uh, or, you know, had to flee. Um, and their factories and organizations were taken over by incompetent people. And then they just ran the country uh, down. So, you know, these are real examples that when second-handers take over, they really cannot build anything, they can only destroy. So I want to share my screen here. Um, Maritza, can you give me permission to... Okay, yeah, I think I can share screen. So I want to um, just talk about values. And um, I know that um, Sherry mentioned about, you know, how Montessori, uh, and, and while I was reading this section, it actually just became very apparent to me that it is so important for children to develop these values. And uh, Sherry, you talked about when you had your children, what values you wanted and what you really didn't want to happen. Like you didn't want certain elements, certain ideas. Last uh, week when we spoke, Iris talked about her, parent, uh, her parents, and I just wrote that as a 12-pointer guide for good parenting skills. So uh, what, what do you really want for your children? And you want them to grow up as moral citizens. You want them to grow up with the idea that they have the power within them to create the world they want. And so every year at the beginning of our school year, our students make the rules for the classroom. And those are the rules that they live by. It becomes the class constitution and it becomes a living document for them to live by. So why do we do this? Why do we have core values? And Tony is here. Uh, he used to run his um, studio uh, for martial arts and he had six core values. And every time my son went in, the first thing they would do is get on the mat, say the core values, bow, and then start. And they would end the session with core values. And it may seem like a dogmatic practice, um, similar to a prayer or religion, but I feel where uh, my husband and I weren't very religious uh, and didn't want religion to be the focus for us. And values made a big difference that how do you have individual values and how do you stick to those values? So um, we have six core values at the school, be respectful, just like, you know, respect yourself first before you can respect others. Uh, seek truth, use your own judgment to come up with your own opinions. Do not let others dictate to you what those opinions are. Don't just follow a mob because they're saying. Um, so look at the facts. Everyone can do better. Everybody has a path to grow to their highest potential. So instead of comparing students with test scores or, you know, uh, usually tests are a very short term way of looking at saying, you know, how, is, how are the students doing? And usually the test will say, oh, not doing very well in this area. So let's focus on their challenges. Whereas in a Montessori classroom, the, it's just turned around. You say, what are your strengths and how can you get better at the areas that you are working on? So whether it's penmanship, workmanship, craftsmanship, sportsmanship, what do those words mean and how can you get really good at that? So the whole idea in Montessori is to develop the individual, to develop your own individual strengths. Because when the individual is strong, then you can actually uh, develop the, the society because society is made up of individuals. And if you have children who grow up with values, they're going to impart those values in their life and in the environment they create around them. 
live with dignity and integrity. Um, that's something we talk about, you know, you have to have the courage to be honest. So often children um, will get in conflicts and uh, it's never their fault, it's somebody else's fault. So uh, the teachers take the students to the class constitution. The class constitution hangs outside every classroom and the teachers will walk to the class uh, constitution and say, did you follow the, the rules that you made? And it's not a teacher reprimanding a student, but now the child really focusing on saying, am I behaving correctly? So this whole balance between what's right, what's wrong. The uh, Maria Montessori observed that the, the sense of justice is developed between the ages of seven and 15. And so if a child doesn't understand what's right, what's wrong, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, they don't have the balance then as adults, it's very hard for them to function. Um, so living with dignity and integrity, teachers will often say, you know, it takes a lot of courage to be honest and own your actions. And at the end of the day, children spend a lot of time at school. The whole point is to have a, a joyful sense of life. So uh, this is a middle school constitution and the they end with be positive. So the, it's a very uplifting um, way to kind of, uh, to, to be in school is be positive. Here are two other examples. Um, you can see center yourself is a huge uh, focus for that particular class, be virtuous. Um, and wherever you go, you go with your heart. So these are, values that children can then, it becomes part of who they are. Uh, here's a class constitution on the right for children in kindergarten to grade three. Again, being honest, being respectful, being responsible comes up again and again. Uh, here is a class constitution that uh, the upper elementary students have. And so it's a long piece, I've divided it into uh, three pictures. Uh, they took the preamble from the constitution. Uh, every year they do study the preamble, the, the constitution of the United States and why it was written. Uh, so it says, we the people of Poseidon room in order to form a more perfect learning environment, secure equality and together strive for excellence, agreed to uphold this constitution for the upper elementary room. And so they go on to say, adopt a growth mindset, use your opportunities judiciously. Consider the ideas from others. Talk softly so as not to disturb others. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Center yourself, envision your surroundings. Care for yourself and the environment. Ask if your friend, ask a friend if your glue doesn't stick. So if they're having a problem, have candy, just, you know, and have a joyful sense of life. I just love that, have a joyful sense of life because I think that there is so much going on around the world that if if you know if you help um, students help children have that sense from their childhood, basically they have it in them. Every child has it in them. But it's all these external things that we add on to children that make it make them miserable or kind of make them feel that they're not. Uh, able to do things or not able to achieve their goals. But just giving them the opportunity uh, can help them see that somebody like Howard Rourke is possible, so that you can make a difference in today's world. Uh, so that's my uh, take on Montessori and Ayn Rand and uh, Fountainhead. So I think it all kind of comes together in there. And then the last thing I wanted to just share is. Um, the unions. Wynan had never given a thought to the union. Dominique had tried to warn him once. Gail, if people want to organize for wages, hours, or practical demands, it's their proper right. But when there's no tangible purpose, you'd better watch closely. We knew, uh, so then there is the strike. And here are the union uh, members saying, 
While we recognize an owner's right to dictate the policy of his paper on political, sociological, and economic issues, we believe that a situation has gone past the limit of decency when an employer expects self-respecting men to espouse a cause of common criminal. We wish Mr. Wyman to realize that the day of dictatorial one-man rule is past. We must have a say in running of the place where we make our living. It is a fight for the freedom of the press. And Wyman goes to say, so if I were, if I wasn't sitting on the steps um, of, uh, if I was not sitting on the uh, steps and got them the job, they would not have their jobs at the banner, nor would they have the freedom of press. So to not recognize the creator, to not recognize what really goes into creation. I mean, my note on the side is go create it yourself because once you try to create something, you see how difficult that is. And yet the creators do it with joy because they just love it. There's no other way for them. And uh, we see this even in today's media, right? That uh, anyone who's successful must have got there by, uh, you know, some tricks or something. How could they have done it on their own merit or using their own brain? Um, so I think that fight continues. Uh, the the fight that uh, Ayn Rand uh, kind of highlights in in uh, the Fountainhead. So with that, um, I think Joya is next. Yes, Joy is up next. Thank you, Polly. And I would say I love that none of the Montessori students were forming a more perfect union. I thought that was just perfect. <laughs> I'm actually going to take us in a totally different direction today because I'm aware we were supposed to only be reading up to chapter 15 today, but I have so much that I want to say about chapter 16 and then so much else that I'm gonna to wanna to say next time about the end of the book. So I really even just wanted to focus today all about chapter 16. And so this is even a spoiler alert if anybody didn't was reading along with us and didn't read to chapter 16, this is your warning that this is what I wanna talk about is chapter 16 today. And in the letters of Ayn Rand book, there's an interesting letter where she's talking all about the craft of writing. And she mentions that in her view, the two best passages of writing in the Fountainhead are one, the boy on the bicycle sequence, which we've talked about a lot now in multiple meetups. And I think most of us here all agree is definitely one of the best sequences of writing in the book. But the other passage that Ayn Rand herself identified that she thought represented her best writing was the sequence where Wynand is walking through the streets after he betrays Howard Work. And so I, I really wanna focus a lot on that, but I wanna take us even to the very beginning, uh, how chapter 16 starts off. And some of the other commentators have been uh, making the point that the book in many ways sometimes almost reads like a movie. And this is a sequence where I, I get that cinematic sense because when we ended, chapter 15. We've ended where, uh, you know, Wynand has been putting all of this work into trying to keep the banner alive. You know, it's been taking everything out of him. He's gone to see work. And even that's just like put him on a high. Dominique, you know, as people are pointing out, says that he looks lighter. He comes back. He's got all of this energy to keep up with the fight, to keep up with the crusade. And uh, chapter 15 ends by telling us that the days passed, days of heroic effort put to put out a newspaper that came back unbought and unread. And then we're gonna, there's like a cut in the movie and we're gonna cut to chapter 16. And when chapter 16 starts out, we are in the board room of the wine and papers. And, you know, we, we first see the other characters, the, the other members of the board, they're kind of talking about, you know, what, what's going on with the paper and how they're not gonna be able to survive with everything that's going on. And before Wynand even speaks, we start to get insight into um, what he's thinking. Um, so, 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 you know, first we just kind of we see him there, you know, Wynand stood by his chair at the head of the table. He looked like a drawing from a men's magazine, fastidiously groomed, a white handkerchief in the breast pocket of his dark suit. And even as he's standing there, we get wine in thought of a crumbling wall on the edge of the Hudson. He heard steps approaching blocks away, 
Only this time, there were no wires in his hand to hold his muscles ready. And as they're talking more, we get more of Wynan's thoughts. Wynan starts thinking, um, well, so, so one of them says to Wynan, like, Wynan, you ain't what you used to be. And then Wynan thinks, I never used to be. I've never been here. Why are you afraid to look at me? Don't you know that I'm the least among you? The half-naked women in the Sunday supplement, the babies in the rotogravure. I don't even know what that word is. <laughs> Maybe Robert Sherry, will, uh, with all of their knowledge of the culture of the 20s, will uh, give us some insight into, I'm probably not even pronouncing that word right, but something from the old press, obviously. Um, the editorials on park squirrels, they were your souls given expression. The straight stuff of your souls, but where was mine? And then he goes on to think, I know you. You're the one who'd give money to a pregnant slut, but not to a starving genius. I've seen your face before. I picked you and I brought you in. When in doubt about your work, remember that man's face. You're writing for him. But Mr. Winan, when I can't remember his face, one can, child, one can. It will come back to remind you. It will come back and demand payment. And I'll pay. I signed a blank check long ago and now it's presented for collection. But a blank check is always made out to the sum of everything you've got. So we see that between the cut at the end of chapter 15 and the start of chapter 16, that Wynand has had this realization that we all knew he was going to have. You know, we, we've kind of seen the background and from what's been happening in the story, um, from what work has suggested that you know, Wynand, as he put it, was this, this character who was not born to be a second hander, but that going after power was the worst form of second handedness. But when we jump into chapter 16, Wynand has had that realization. But we don't ever get, like that, there's never that light bulb moment. There's never that scene of recognition. We never see him suddenly have this realization about himself and his past. There, there's like almost this, this dramatic cut between how we were at the end of chapter 15, and then we're gonna jump into chapter 16, where he's going to have this, this grand realization. And I think it's a really profound point even about Ayn Rand's writing, because we know as much as she is the champion of reason, of the men of the mind, that her whole point is that thinking is for the purpose of action. So she's never going to give us a scene in her novels where there's just some sort of thought without action. And it's not just, and it's her literary style, but it's her literary style because it's her philosophical premises that the whole point of thinking is to act. So what she's gonna show us in the book is the dramatic sequence. So you know, in a sense, you know, what she's really gonna show us is what's gonna happen here toward the, the end of the section of the boardroom where Wynand is going to have to make this dramatic decision. You know, is he going to continue the crusade for Howard Wark or is he going to give in in order to save the banner? That's the moment we're going to see, that key moment of action. That's what she's going to dramatize for us. And it, we see how she even builds up to the scene with everybody there in the boardroom, you know, kind of pointing out that, you know, the banner can't go on like this. They're saying, you know, you can't keep this up. Even if you bought us all out, give in or close the banner, you had better give in. Wynan heard that. He heard it through all the speeches. He had heard it for days before the meeting. He knew it better than any man present. Close the banner. He saw a picture, the masthead rising over the door of the Gazette. You had better give in. He made a step back. It was not a wall behind him. It was only the side of his chair. He thought of the moment in his bedroom when he had almost pulled a trigger. He knew he was pulling it now. All right, he said. That's the scene she's giving us, that dramatic moment where it's either the banner or the crusade. It's, it's either this thing that he's built that is 
you know, decrepit and goes against his values or the purity of his own soul. And he's going to have that realization. There's one point where Ayn Rand in talking about writing always says that, um, and she quotes a, a famous playwright who always says, um, you know, you never introduce a gun in a scene unless you're going to pull it in the final sequence. And she, we see that she kind of gives us our own uh, version of that, that she introduced an actual physical gun when we first uh, had the first sequence of Wynand in the beginning of the section that bears his name. And he doesn't pull a literal gun, but he perhaps pulls a more important gun. He's gonna commit spiritual suicide here in this moment and, and pull the gun on his soul. And then we get into the, this long walk, Wynan's walk after the betrayal. And again, I think it's significant that we're seeing that he's going to have this really dramatic moment that happens internally, but she's got to show it to us in action. And you all know me, I'm going to want to read this whole <laughs> sequence to you, which I'm not going to put you all through, but I, I do at least want to read parts of this for you and definitely want to start off even with the beginning. I think it's, it's really beautiful and insightful the way that she starts off this walk. It starts with, it's only a bottle cap thought Wynand, looking down at a speck of glitter under his feet. A bottle cap ground into the pavement. The pavements of New York are full of things like that. Bottle caps, safety pins, campaign buttons, sink chains, sometimes lost jewels. It's all alike now, flattened, ground in. It makes the pavements sparkle at night. The fertilizer of a city. Someone drank the bottle empty and threw the cap away. How many cars have passed over it? Could one retrieve it now? Could one kneel and dig with bare hands and tear it out again? I had no right to hope for escape. I had no right to kneel and seek redemption. Millions of years ago, when the earth was being born, there were living things like me, flies caught in resin that became amber, animals caught in ooze that became rock. I am a man of the 20th century. And I became a bit of tin in the pavements for the trucks of New York to roll over. He walked slowly, the collar of his top coat raised. The street stretched before him, empty, and the buildings ahead were like the backs of books lining a shelf, assembled without order, of all sizes. The corners he passed led to black channels. Street lamps gave the city a protective cover, but it cracked in spots. He turned a corner when he saw a slant of light ahead. It was a goal for three or four blocks. To me, this is just even so emotionally evocative of the experience of dealing with the kind of internal experience that Wynan must be facing in this moment. It, it always makes me remember, I, I had an experience once where I almost fainted, I, I almost blacked out, and I was, I was in the bathroom, and there, there was that moment when, like, I knew I couldn't stand anymore, and it was, like, my whole conscious, like, it's like all I could be aware of was just that like I knew I had to like sit down and it was like all I could see was like this like wall in the bathroom where I knew I could just sit and like lean against the wall so that I wasn't gonna fall and and remembering that experience of when we are in crisis mode that this is what happens that you know our our ability to focus what we can take in with our consciousness narrows and I think it's so profoundly dramatized in this sequence that, you know, there, there's so much on his mind. His whole past is coming now, you know, to claim for payment. But it starts with he can only just focus on that one tiny little bottle cap. And then Ayn Rand, you know, with, with her brilliant writing, I think here just, you know, creates just this beautiful metaphor of, you know, taking that pinpoint of awareness of the bottle cap and then just, you know, this, this metaphors of thinking about the sparkle in the city, you know, the, the comparison of the lost jewels with just the refuse of what people throw away and comparing this to Wynand and what he's let his soul become from what he's done with the banner. And then again, as he's walking through and there's, you know, his only goal is just, you know, th those blocks, you know, a few blocks ahead that 
that that's all that he can let in in his consciousness. So you know, he's not going through a physical crisis, but in this moment of a mental crisis, it's like he can't even let the realization of everything in. He can only have that focus of just a few blocks ahead. And, and I think it's beautiful how she uses the walk and what he's going to see on the walk to bring up all the things that's going on in his consciousness. So we know that he's going to want to think back to his past of what had happened when he was a youth in Hell's Kitchen. But part of that is she's going to take us on this walk that leads him through to Hell's Kitchen. Uh, and even how the awareness of what he's done to work eventually even comes with when they're bringing out the banner. So as he's going through his walk, you know, it's late at night, but the, the first editions of the, the newest version of the banner are coming out. And so it's even here, right, that she's giving us the action of what's happening, where he's going to see what it is that's happened. Uh, so, so even just sort of this description of, you know, so we, nobody had been buying the banner, but, you know, now there's sort of this new headline that, you know, he's going to be going back on what it was he had said. And so all of a sudden, everybody is going to be interested now in the banner. So it's just, you know, he waited for the sound to die. Then he walked to the stand, the banner, he said. He did not see who sold him the paper, whether it was a man or a woman. He saw only a gnarled brown hand pushing the copy forward. He started walking away, but stopped while crossing the street. There was a picture of Rourke on the front page. It was a good picture. The calm face, the sharp cheekbones, the implacable mouth. He read the editorial, leaning against a pillar of the elevated subway. And then again, you know, we're, we're gonna see through the action what it is that everyone says about that, you yeah. know. Uh, and then it just sort of ends with, um, you know, if found guilty, it seems inevitable. Howard Work must be made to bear the full penalty the law can impose on him. It was signed Gail Winand. And then we see how he's going to respond to it. You know, When he looked up, he was in a brightly lighted street on a trim sidewalk, looking at a wax figure exquisitely contorted on a satin chaise lounge in a shop window. The figure wore a salmon colored negligee. And now I'm wondering if that even has to do with uh, Sherry's observation about people wearing coral. Uh, salmon also, that, that same kind of uh, shade of orange with a little touch of pink. Right? Salmon colored negligee, loose sight sandals, and a string of pearls suspended from one raised finger. He did not know when he had dropped the paper. It was not in his hands any longer. He glanced back. It would be impossible to find a discarded paper lying on some street. He did not know he had passed. He thought... What for? There are other papers like it. The city is full of them. And that's like he hears in his mind how it works saying, you have been the one encounter of my life that can never be repeated. And in his own mind, he's responding. Howard, I wrote that editorial 40 years ago. I wrote it one night when I was 16 and stood on the roof of a tenement. And this is when he gets to Hell's Kitchen and he realizes that he never got out of Hell's Kitchen. He said, I never got out. I surrendered to the grocery man, to the deck hands on the ferry boat, to the owner of the pool room. You don't run things around here. You don't run things around here. You've never run things anywhere, Gail Winand. You've only added yourself to the things they ran. Then he looked up across the city to the shapes of the great skyscrapers. He saw the string of lights rising unsupported in black space, a glowing pinnacle, anchored to nothing, a small brilliant square hanging detached in the sky. He knew the famous buildings to which these belonged. He could reconstruct their forms in space. He thought, you're my judges and witnesses. You rise unhindered above the sagging roofs. You shoot your gracious tension to the stars out of the slack, the tired, the accidental. The eyes one mile out on the ocean will see none of this and none of this will matter but you will be the presence and the city. As down the centuries, a few men stand in lonely rectitude that we may look and say, there is a human race behind us. One can't escape from you. The streets change, but one looks up and there you stand unchanged. You have seen me walking through the streets tonight. 
You have seen all my steps and all my years. It's you that I have betrayed. For I was born to be one of you. There's a little bit more, but I just even want to end with that, reading that with just that image of, you know, he's betrayed Rourke, but he's really betrayed his own soul. But he sees that reflected in the grandeur of the skyscrapers, in their unchanging eternal quality that that stands as you know this is what is possible this is what the human race can do this is the proof the physical living proof that there is as he says a human race behind us and this gets into the other um, part about this climax that I really want to talk about which is the character of Gail Winant to me Gail Winant is one of the most interesting characters in all of Ayn Rand's novels because he represents a way in which Ayn Rand herself changed. So if you've been on any of these other meetups, you know this is something that I, I've talked about a lot. Um, I, Ayn Rand and her view, her view that she had of herself um, uh, and the ideal of the unchanging. So I had even talked about, there's a beautiful passage that I really do love where Mallory talks about work as being what the idea of immortality really means, that he has that, that sense of the eternal. And I, this was Ayn Rand's view of herself in, in the introduction to this book. I, you know, she describes herself as being the same, only more so. And I'm gonna say that it starts to frustrate me that she doesn't recognize so much the ways that she changes. But before I get to that, I do wanna say, I think there really is something profound about this point that really gets to the heart of, of Ayn Rand's real discoveries about what is virtuous in human character. What we're seeing in this book, which is all about the glory of integrity and what it is to be principled. And that this is what principles give us. It gives us, the opportunity to be like the skyscrapers that don't change because that principle stays the same. And so I want to acknowledge that, that I think that that is an ideal that I believe that Ayn Rand holds up to us in this book and that it is an ideal that I, I do believe we all should strive for. But <laughs> I also do believe that we also change. And Ayn Rand doesn't recognize so much when she makes changes. But Gail Winand is this fascinating character, I believe, because he represents an important way that Ayn Rand herself changed in her views and displays it in this incredibly dramatic form. So I think we know, and maybe even Rob had mentioned um, in, in some of the earlier meetups, I know he was talking at one point about the early Ayn Rand. So in her own view, um, you know, she recognized that uh, before she wrote The Fountainhead, that she wasn't, that she felt, you know, in, in her earlier works, that she wasn't yet able to capture the ideal man. That this had been her goal, you know, from when she had decided that she was going to be a fiction writer at the age of nine, that the goal of her writing was always to project the ideal man, uh, but that before she actually wrote The Fountainhead, she didn't quite feel that she was capable of, of doing that yet. But it's interesting that she, as much as she admits that, she never really talks about, you know, what was perhaps, like, what changed, like, what, what suddenly made her able to write The Fountainhead, um, you know, and what were perhaps any interesting distinctions between the early Ayn Rand and what she finally gets to in her mature novels. But one of the things that I think is fascinating that I see as a very distinct difference between the early Ayn Rand and what she creates here in her later writing is this view of what is the ideal man's relationship to power. I think you can see this. So Rob talked about Anthem. So I want to talk about some of her other earlier work. So first, I want to talk a little bit about Night of January the 16th, which was a play that she wrote and had produced uh, on Broadway uh, shortly before working on this book. And so this was an example, that might have even been the, the very specific work where she mentioned explicitly that uh, she could write about 
a woman's feeling toward the ideal man, but didn't yet feel herself capable of writing the ideal man. And it's interesting what happens in the plot. So I am not going to spoil the story for you by telling you that this story starts with the hero of the book, whose name is Bjorn Faulkner, is dead. The story is a trial where his mistress and his wife um, are, are you know sort of sort of on trial and we're trying to find out what happened to Bjorn Faulkner and he's supposed to be the ideal but he never appears in in the play in the story and it's almost I think significant that you know she wasn't yet ready to write the ideal man and the ideal man never yet appears in the story but when we even get glimmers of who is Bjorn Faulkner I would argue that he is much more of a Wynand than a Rourke from our descriptions of him, he was very similar to a Wynand who, like Wynand, his virtue is that he never sought an outside sanction. He had that creative energy and that will to you know, seek out and, and you know, change the world, that ability to not be a second hander. But what we see that he's done uh, throughout the story is he's uh, this um, financier who swindles a lot of people. Uh, he has this one catchphrase line where he says that um, the only two enjoyable things that he found on earth was his whip over the world and his mistress, Karen Andre. Even that line, you know, the whip over the world sounds like a perfect description of Gail Winant. And we see some of this also in, in some of our other um, Ayn Rand's earlier works. And I wanted to even talk a little bit about We the Living. So uh, Rob had even mentioned We the Living um, earlier today, kind of talking about how this was you know, Ayn Rand's work that she wrote about her experiences uh, growing up as a young person in her 20s in Soviet Russia. At one point, she even said that this was the most autobiographical book she had ever or would ever write, that the main character, Kira, that the events of the novel, what happens to Kira was not what happened to her, but that the character of Kira, her thoughts, her ideas, her values, her ideals, they were all Ayn Rand. But something interesting happened with the publication of this book. So it initially came out in 1936. And decades later, after uh, and, and so, and the book didn't, didn't do very well, um, you know, and it, I think it even just sort of stopped being published early on. But then, you know, Ayn Rand wrote The Fountainhead and she wrote Atlas Shrugged. And so then in 1959, they came out with a new version of We the Living. And I, Ayn Rand took that opportunity to make some changes to the copy of We the Living. And in the introduction to the book, she, she describes in her own words, the kinds of changes that she believes she made to the book. So, um, so she says in this introduction here, she says, I want to account for the editorial changes which I have made in the text of this novel for its present reissue. The chief inadequacy of my literary means was grammatical, a particular kind of uncertainty in the use of the English language, which reflected the transitional state of a mind thinking no longer in Russian, but not yet fully in English. I have changed only the most awkward or confusing lapses of this kind. I have reworded the sentences and clarified their meaning without changing their content. I have not added or eliminated anything to or from the content of the novel. Uh, I have cut out some sentences and a few paragraphs that were repetitious or so confusing in their implications that to clarify them would have necessitated, necessitated lengthy additions. In brief, all the changes are merely editorial line changes. The novel remains what uh, and as it was. But if you actually ever go back and read the 1936 edition of this book, um, 
you will find Ayn Rand made lots of changes. I, I saw one scholar who actually tried to add it all up and thought there were maybe about 3,000 changes that she made. And admittedly, many of the changes were of the kind that she mentions. Um, you know, she took out commas, she added commas. Um, there were clearly instances where um, you could tell, you know, her, her English grammar was not perfect. And there were many, many of those thousands of changes were line changes. But she also made changes that I would argue do change the content of the book. And so just one that I wanted to share, because uh, I think it's going to be relevant to the character of Gail Wynan and what we've been discussing here. So there's one point where Kira is talking with Andre, who's the idealistic communist in the book. And um, Andre says to her, uh, you're going to say, as so many of our enemies do, that you admire our ideals, but loathe our methods. And Kira says, I loathe your ideals. But then there was more in the 1936 version of the book that gets edited out by 1959. So in 1936, Kira says, I loathe your ideals. I admire your methods. If one believes one's right, one shouldn't wait to convince millions of fools. One might just as well force them except that I don't know, however, however, whether I'd include blood in my methods. And Andre says, why not? Anyone can sacrifice his own life for an idea. How many know the devotion that makes you capable of sacrificing other lives? Horrible, isn't it? And Kira says, admirable, if you're right. But are you right? And then it goes on, and then we go back into the section that is in what she kept in the book. Um, you know, and you can see here that Kira and Ayn Rand in 1936 uh, you clearly disagreed with the communist ideals and did not think the ideals were right. But 1936, Ayn Rand and Kira also, I think very clearly state that they admire the Soviet methods, that they are fine with, um, you know, as, as she says it here, um, you know, not waiting to convince millions of fools, but just as well forcing them, which to me sounds very much like what Gail Wynand does in the book. And I think if we see kind of how Ayn Rand progressed, we can perhaps see what sort of happened here. So in one of our very first meetups, I shared um, from the biographical interviews, how Ayn Rand even first got the idea of the book, how of the Fountainhead, how she was inspired by a conversation she had with uh, someone she was working with back when uh, Ayn Rand was still just kind of doing menial, uh, like odd labor jobs when she was working in Hollywood, and uh, there was this this person, Marcella. Um, who, uh, you know, as Ayn Rand said, like she could tell that she was a really hard worker, but, uh, you know, at an emotional level, she could tell that she didn't uh, you know, agree with this person. And, you know, she finally asked Marcella what's, what's motivating her. And, and Marcella gives this famous answer about how, uh, you know, if, if other people have cars, she wants a car. If other people have two cars, she wants more cars. And it's all about other people. And Ayn Rand says for her that that was a kind of light bulb moment that in that response from Marcella, which she would have never, thought about or got on her own, that she saw immediately there, as she said, like herself, Ayn Rand versus Marcella, that she grasped the first-hander versus the second-hander. And it's probably clear that once she got that idea clearly in conceptual terms, when she made the distinction of the first-hander and the second-hander, that you know, thinking it through, it would become clear that a person who goes after power is just another kind of second-hander. That probably didn't come as a light bulb moment, uh, probably like in the scene here in the Fountainhead. Uh, you know, it, it didn't just come to her all at once. It was probably just a growing realization, um, you know, as it was for Wine and Tear. But that ultimately, you know, she did change her views from, you know, Kira in 1936. Uh, you know, clearly, we know why this is a passage that she would have wanted to have eliminated in 1959, because clearly it is not at all consistent with her, her mature views. But in Wynand, we see how Ayn Rand gives that error just elaborate dramatic form. So Ayn Rand makes this error, but fixes it really early on. Wynand makes this error and builds a whole career 
and a whole life on this error and ultimately betrays work and that ideal and the best within himself. And I believe that's even why this sequence is so powerful emotionally. So we, we had talked about the boy in the bicycle scene is such an emotional scene. And Ayn Rand had thought other people wouldn't really like it because she thought it was just a, her own personal expression of something she had felt so deeply emotionally. And in the scene of Wynand and his realization of his error, I think we're also just seeing this beautiful representation of Ayn Rand working through her own error. And hopefully we learn from the changes that she makes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joya. And thank you, Maritza, for filling in. Uh, next up is going to be Iris. Give me just a second. I want to make sure that you can unmute. Go ahead, Iris. Uh, let's see. Um, I didn't do the chapters by chapter. I've really been all right. reading the whole book and finding interesting things that I didn't notice before. Um, uh, Iris, Iris, you have made a lifetime of observations about <laughs> Ayn Rand and about Fountainhead. Yeah. So you're welcome to talk about any of them. Thank you. Thank you. It, it all works together. Um, I, I was reading it is actually, I've been listening and reading. Uh, I don't play music in the background anymore. I pay, play Fountainhead in the background when I'm cooking and eating and things. Uh, but I was actually reading the book and uh, at, at the beginning of these meetups, it was like, why do I care about Katie? And you know, what, what, why did Rand put that in? I'm really getting an understanding of it now. Uh, I was reading a paragraph, and I think it's the last sentence in the paragraph, uh, mentions that once Keedy, Keating and Katie, uh, uh, their engagement was known to his mother, they never met except in public. And you know, that, that had just gone by me before. This time I actually thought of what that means and how disgusting it is. I mean, it means that they will never even uh, enjoy uh, you know, deep, passionate kisses. Uh, you know, they aren't the kind of couple they're gonna go off into a dark corner. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, I realized how crushed their love life was. And so I decided to do a small report on the sex lives of four men of the chapter headings. Uh, Rourke begins with the rape. All of it continues in the same grand opera style. Uh, their uh, time together is always explosive. Uh, they're living life on a grand scale. Uh, and that's kind of it for that. But uh, uh, when I was reading Wynad, uh, on page 496, uh, when it said Dominique has never been in love, she asked him why he thinks that. And he said, oh, you know, wouldn't just be an awful night in the theater. Uh, she put the man through hell. And, you know, what she doesn't, what he doesn't know is that marrying him was part of that. Uh, that she would want to be broken, trampled, dominated, because that's the impossible. I, I still don't know exactly what that means to Rand. Uh, it may explain the torture she put Rourke through leading to the rape, or perhaps it's the two marriages. I will explain how I'm going to find out about that later. Okay, go on to Keating. Uh, Keating at one point knows he could have Katie. What a disgusting way to think of sharing lovemaking with a woman who he keeps saying he loves. Uh, he is so stunted, he has no idea how to enjoy any part of his life. And then uh, there's something for some reason in listening to it, I've heard like 20 times. Uh, when they go out to walk together, uh, he takes her hand and she is the one who takes her glove off. 
so they can be skin to skin. And that really is part of his crippled soul is that he doesn't even think about touching her hand rather than just the glove. Okay, Tui, very simple to him, sex is unimportant. He's saying in the drawing room, the lecture platform or during sexual intercourse, he wants people to get rid of an exaggerated reference reference and reverence for the sexual act. He makes fun of the way men think about sexual love. Wynad, before Dominique, he was interested only in power. His mistresses were all women he bought, and they were only women who couldn't be bought. And then his glass wall bedroom, he thinks and talks about uh, fornicating in the sight of six million people. So that's you know, just pulling out just those parts of them. Okay, back to my parents. A uh, few more things that I remembered uh, that, again, they had put into words and into action. Uh, it was very important to them that we could go after anything that appealed to us. Uh, they were not typical for their time. My mother was a tomboy. Uh, my father liked poetry. You know, they they didn't, didn't fit into the very small boxes of the time. Uh, one of the things they were very concerned about uh, when children, and particularly before they can reason, uh, every time they do something wrong, people scream no at them and they stop, but you know, they don't know what they did wrong or why they shouldn't do it again. And uh, so they decided that we were not to hear no at a point at which it meant nothing to us. And actually, you know, once, once a child can reason, you don't just say no, you reason with them, with them. And all of their relatives and friends were told if they wanted to see us, that they had to learn not to say no all the time. And, uh, it was amazing. I mean, they really got people to do that. Uh, grandparents, uncles, you know, miscellaneous friends. And so they were, these were people who were saying no every three seconds to their kids, but never said it to us. So just fascinating things happen. Uh, also important to them was that we were never to be compared to anyone. And again, this is something that all the relatives had to agree to. And so much of the way people talk about children is comparisons. Oh yeah, your great uncle, you know, liked this thing you liked or your parents are like that and that's why you are. Uh, we were never compared to anyone. And my mother's example was that a two-year-old girl should not be told that she looks like her her grandfather who has a mustache. You know, what, what's a Kyle? kid going to do with that. Uh, we were never to be told that we were good at something because some relative was good at that thing. Uh, it was all about being treated as individuals, which nobody else was doing. Uh, when we got near college age, uh, we had moved while I was in high school, at, yeah, still in high school, uh, that uh, no, I'm sorry, we moved while I was still in grammar school, but we moved from uh, lower, lower middle class to upper middle class. Uh, it was Ashkenazi Jewish neighborhood. Everybody went to college. And this is a period when people were not going to college. And uh, they were very concerned as, as much as we were taught to think for ourselves, that it would be so easy for us to be swept up into going to college when everyone in our class was going to college. And they tried to figure out, you know, what, what could they do to make us really stop and think about it? And they decided we has to, had to pay for a first year of college. And uh, I, I don't think I mentioned this when I was talking about Bauhaus. I was offered a four-year scholarship at IIT and I never considered taking it. Okay. Now, this is picking up something that was talked about uh, last week. Uh, Keating's paintings and Rourke telling him that it's too late. Uh, 
Rand, I, I never had a problem with that. Rand had set it up. Uh, she described him as uh, he had a quiet pain, a sole conception of what he wanted to express. And even more important, she said he had something tight, paralyzed as his soul means to express it. I, you know, and oh, one more thing, there was no pleasure and no pride in what he was doing. I, I've been a painter all my life. I started watercoloring when I was two years old. I got to Crayolas later. I don't even know what that's about. Uh, but, uh, you know, I know what it means to be a painter. And uh, Keating had corrupted every part of his soul. Uh, I don't think a lifetime of therapy could turn him into an artist. Maybe some some part of a human being, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, this is a man who wanted to kill and to not kill higher at the same time. Uh, this is a man who said he loved Katie, uh, uh, but then left her and married Dominique. He hated Rourke, he wanted to see him destroyed. Uh, and again, uh, Rand's words, uh, when Dominique is telling Rourke that she's married to Keating, she explains she picked him rather than, quote, some half decent human being. So he's, he's less than that. Uh, I must defend, <laughs> uh, Keating is nothing like Frank O'Connor, uh, Rand's husband who became an artist later in life. Uh, I don't, don't think it had, becoming an artist later in life, I don't think is an issue at all. Uh, there are two major parts to being an artist. One is technique and the other is subject choices. Uh, anyone of average intelligence can be taught to be a photorealist painter, which is what Dolly was. Uh, most people don't know that uh, and wouldn't do it if they, you know, if they knew it takes an enormous amount of effort and time, but uh, you know, anyone can learn technique. I, I once saw a class, these were people who were gonna be kindergarten teachers and they had all been taught how to paint a saltine cracker. So it looks so realistic that you felt you could take it off the uh, a canvas. I uh, mean, it's just, it's, it's easy to develop skill. Uh, but uh, subject choice is a matter of soul, uh, how you see the world and how you see yourself. Uh, if he cared to or could paint some of the greatest works imaginable, just, you know, that, that is his mind. Um, age has nothing to do with technique and, or subject choice. And I had some fun thinking about you know, diff different people. If at age 80, Mike decided he wanted to become a painter, I would love to see what he would create. And I imagined him doing dramatic portraits of earth moving equipment. Okay, I think this may be the last part. Um, it was suggested we pick a favorite quote, uh, which I'll do later. It's, I want to pull things out of Monadnock Valley, but there's no one sentence there. It's all very scattered. But I do have a favorite page, and I've been thinking about it a lot. It's page 582. It is beautiful, pathetic, and funny. Uh, every time I read it, it makes me laugh. Uh, just thinking about it will get me laughing. Uh, it is just so, so much of two opposite pieces. Uh, Rourke is bubbling over with a joy he can barely contain. Uh, and then this whole thing of joy, Wynott had described uh, all of Rourke's buildings as having a quality of a sense of joy, not placid. Iris, Iris yes. now I'm very curious about the page. Uh, would you like to read it or would, would you like uh, no, Joya to read it? No, it's going to come in here. I'm going oh, to do, okay. do the parts account. 
Wonderful. I, uh, anyway, uh, Rourke, uh, Winant had said the buildings had a quality, a sense of joy, not placid, but difficult, demanding joy, an achievement to experience it. I don't remember seeing that anyone else using joy to describe his buildings. Uh, okay, three pages earlier, we, he and Keating agree the Rourke will design Cortland. Two pages earlier, they signed the contract. One page earlier, Rourke, Rourke is laughing, and it's the happiest laugh Keating has ever heard. Uh, a little further down in that same page, Keating realized, I think this is really crucial to what has me laughing. Keating realized he had never believed any living being could be glad of the gifts, gift of existence, and Rourke is. And so he's there's a way in which he's aware of how crippled he is, just seeing Rourke enjoying his life. So uh, at this point, it's all settled. Rourke points out the window. This is what's on this page. Rourke points out his window and says, when it's done, I'll be able to see it, meaning Cortland, uh, from my window, and it will be part of the city. Peter, have, have I ever told you how much I love the city? Now that is so beautiful. I mean, that, that is what work is about. The giving someone else this thing that he loves, he's going to describe how much he loves the city. And it is the last thing that Keating wants to hear. I, there is nothing in Keating's existence that he loves, which is another reason why he can't be a painter. You know, when, when I paint, it's like, what's the most wonderful thing in the world? What's the most beautiful thing in the world? You know, that, that's where I start. Uh, he has nothing. And the contrast between Rourke, who's just floating, I mean, he's, he is the happiest we've ever seen him. This is the root of the joy in his building is the joy he's feeling in thinking about the, that he's about to do it. And, and Keating is at his lowest and it's over the same thing. I mean, Rourke is going to give the gift of describing how much he loves the city and that that is not what Keating ever wants to hear. Uh, Keating finishes his drink, and I've been listening to the Christopher Hurt version, which you can listen to free online. And uh, he does a wonderful pause in answer to, you know, have I told you how much I love this city? And uh, Keating's answer is, I think I'd rather go now, <laughs> yeah, which is, yeah, I don't, I don't want to even be in the room with you. You know, anyone who's thinking that way, you know, uh, I, I wrote here, it's an understatement. Uh, then there's a pause, and that is when Keating does stay and show his paintings. So it's just an amazing page, you know, with so much in it. Oh, now this is back to something I said much earlier. I said, I expect to find out what Wynette's statement about Dominique meant. Uh, because I'm, I'm doing all this stuff and I'm thinking, you know, there is that big book, the essays of Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, all these different scholars. Uh, so I went to look at it and I really recommend going to Amazon uh, the first essay in the book is Shoshana Milgram, and it's called The Fountainhead from Notebook to Novel, the Composition of Ayn Rand's First Ideal Man. And you can read most of it online. Uh, I've ordered it, I could get a $10 used copy. I may actually buy the $45 Kindle, uh, but it's a long essay, very long, because I don't know if if the samples are 10% or 20% of the book, but it's very long. And what she did was she took all of Rand's notes, 
all of the cut material. There were long things that Rand wrote. She would write long speeches and then cut the whole speech and just leave someone's facial expression or comment or something. Uh, and so, you know, that's, that's, that long speech is what that facial expression meant to Rand. So it's really great to read them. And uh, um, anyway, I, I had no idea that the, so much of this material was there. And uh, uh, Shoshana and I email each other all the time. And uh, you know, I told her that it seemed like a life work to me. She had taken each one of these things that she found and explained how, how it fit into what actually went in print in the end. And uh, she, by the way, she mentioned to me, a new book has just been found with Rand's notes in it. She hasn't seen it yet, so I don't know how much is in it. And, you know, it might be another month of her life or it might be a year, who knows? Uh, so it, it really is fun to listen to this free segment uh, on Amazon. Uh, and then also in the book, uh, I'm kind of curious to see, Andy Bernstein has a chapter, Understanding the Rape Scene. There are 16 essays by 14 people. And uh, as I said, you know, I'm getting a $10 copy. <laughs> anyway, I really recommend listening to, uh, to the section of the essay. There I am. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Iris. Now, I am really curious about that page. So would uh, Joya, would you do the honors of reading that entire page? Or Iris, you can go ahead and do that. If you could just no, read no. the entire no, page. Not Joya. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not sure I have the exact same page numbers as Iris. So she's got to tell me yeah, like exactly where very, it starts and where it ends. Yeah, they're very close. Um, it's 583. I think. I mean, like I, I'm still like because I think part that of where you started was Marissa um. Has found, found it, but it's a. Can you read it? Sure. Go okay, ahead. so um, she said it started with um, uh, work. So this is when this is when they're done and work gets up. So he says um. Maybe the concepts don't make sense. Maybe they don't mean what people. Wait, that's yeah. not the beginning. I I apologize. Yeah, um, no, it, when, when it's done, it's that paragraph or, or it is. So I should start with that paragraph. Okay. So maybe the concepts don't make sense. Maybe they don't mean what people have been taught to think they mean. But let's drop that now. If you've got to talk of something, let's talk of what we're going to do. He leaned out to look through the open window. It will stand down there. That dark stretch, that's the sight of Cortland. When it's done, I'll be able to see it from my window. Then it will be part of the city. Peter, have I ever told you how much I love this city? He didn't swallow the rest of the liquid in his glass. I think I'd rather go now, Howard. I'm no good tonight. I'll call you in a few days. We'd better meet here. Don't come to my office. You don't want to be seen there, someone might guess. By the way, later, when my sketches are done, you'll have to copy them yourself in your own manner. Some people would rec recognize my way of drawing. Yes, all right. Keaton rose and stood looking uncertainly at his briefcase for a moment, then picked it up. He mumbled some vague words of pardon, took his hat, he walked to the door, then stopped and looked down at his briefcase. Howard, I brought something I wanted to show you. He walked back into the room and put the briefcase on the table. I haven't shown it to anyone. His fingers fumbled, opening the straps. Not to Mother or Ellsworth Tui. I just want you to tell me if there's any. He handed to Rourke six of his canvases. And that's the, oh. that's the section. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. And thank you, Iris. Always amazing, amazing observations with, and a great range of topics. Just, just beautiful. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
Um, all right, folks. So now it's time for questions. Can I mention a little thing that I love about um, Iris's favorite scene that she didn't talk about, but that, that I noticed that I, I really love. Um, and, and Maritza kind of read part of it because we're, we're talking about how uh, Keating had swallowed the rest of the glass in his liquid. And right before that, right after the Howard work laughed again, <laughs> part of the sequence, um, he says, now relax, Peter, want a drink? I feel that calls back to there was that earlier scene when Keating had come and was, you know, trying to get work to come work uh, for him and Francone and wants to take Pete and wants to take work out for a drink. And, you know, when work's telling Peter that that's not part of the job description. But now we see the inverse of that, that work is happy to, you know, celebrate with drinks when and it's on his terms. Wonderful, great point. Um, all right, folks, so it's time for uh, anybody uh, to make any comments or put any questions. Um, you know, anybody uh, attendee is willing, uh, is, uh, you know, welcome to do that. And in addition, if, uh, and attendees get priority. Um, and then if any of the panelists would like to put some question on the table, in general or to anyone in specific, you're welcome to do that as well. So we're gonna start with, and take your time, Evanik followed by Cho, Evanik. First of all, thank you to the panel. You, you guys did an excellent job as usual. Um, so I think what I wanted to start with is Ellsworth Tui, when he's talking about, um, you know, making, so when he, so when he's going back and he's talking about, you know, self, uh, being sacrificing and being selfless, right? Or, you know, uh, not thinking of yourself at all. And I was thinking that sounds a lot like my last church. And I think it sounds like a lot of institutional churches where they tell you, you know, you're second, right? You should put others' needs to have your own. Now, if now we've been studying the Gospel of John, and we know that's not actually what it says. It just says, treat others as you yourself would like to be treated. And you would love others as you would love yourself. That's what the scriptures actually say. And what churches and leaders have constantly and consistently done is, you know, you have to put others above yourself. And I see it in the Western culture in a sense as well, because we claim to be a Christian country and we, we say you put others ahead of yourself, right? That's the, that's the ideal, that's the virtue that we go for. And when Tui is talking about, you know, like that can't make you happy or, you know, that that, you know, that what do you could see the mind control there that when he's talking to other people, in the book, I think he's at this party with these elites and, you know, they're talking about how it's so selfish to, um, to look out for yourself. And it, it, it's so selfish and it's so bad. And I think what it is, I forget the person's name. Uh, she talks about, you know, people who are not so selfless should be shot. And I was like, wow. And I was thinking of that and I was thinking, this could be 2020 too, right? Like this could be our current situation where people talk about, oh, we have to like, you know, put our needs second and, you know, pay your taxes. And, you know, we're all talking about how the rich should pay more taxes and, you know, they should pay way more than, you know, what they're paying now and, and, and this thing. And I was thinking like, wow, that is a way of control, right? And I think Rand makes a point that, you know, I, now I see why people say she is an anti-socialist after reading that. And there's a part where uh, Keating and Howard are talking about Cortland, right? And Howard is saying to Peter, you know, Peter's trying to come up with reasons why he should do it. And one of the reasons is, you know, it's, you know, you're helping the poor people, you know, you're, and, and Howard's like, no. Nah. No, that's not why I'm going to do it. Because he was like, truth be told, I don't believe in, you know, the idea of public housing because you're going to take from what essentially would be today, the middle class from somebody who's making 40, I think he said $40 a week. And you're going to take their tax, you're going to tax them to give to the person that's making $15 a week. So 
you're subsidizing it by taxing the middle class. So you have the elites that can afford to live anywhere that they want in the New York City. And then you have uh, people who are going to be able to live better than a $15 a week person being able to live better than a $40 a week person because you're taking away from them. And then they will eventually have to even go into like, I think he said it's undeveloped or yeah, undeveloped brownstone living. And so I was like, oh, that's because I wasn't getting it when I was like reading through it before. And then I got to that part and I'm like, that's why they say and is a, Rand is a anti-socialist. But if you think about it, um, being selfish, or I wouldn't even say call it being selfish, it's just taking care of yourself should be your ultimate goal. Like, how are you going to take care of anybody else if you can't take care of yourself? What good are you going to be to someone else if you are suffering? And what good is it? Like, you're you're going to be resentful and bitter. You're going to be P Peter Keating in a sense. Is that, you, you know, you may not be, you know, you may not have done the things that Peter Keating does, but you're going to have that, that bitterness and resentment because you are sacrificing yourself and everybody else is, leave, is living good. And I think about it, and, and I think about it in terms of my church, because that's where I saw it, the, the biggest thing about it, is they used to say, you know, when you would, when you, they would ask you to do something like volunteer for a church activity, and you would say no, like sometimes I would just say no, and they would ask me why. And I was the person, this is probably why I'm not a part of the church anymore, that would say no is a perfectly acceptable response and I don't owe you any explanation. And I was told that I was selfish. I was told that I was going against the Bible. And we do this in America and we do this in society. You know, if somebody tells, if you ask somebody to do something and they say no, what, what do you get? And I'm sure everybody here has experienced this, right? You get this sentence of oh why why don't you want to do it and then there then when you say why because I used to say why and that's why I stopped saying why then they would say but it's going to be so much fun like if they want you to go out or it's going to be you know so fulfilling and this is the reason why and what I got especially in my church was like that's just a form of manipulation you want me to do what you want to do and it's fine if you ask me but my, the, my thing now is that no is a perfectly acceptable response. It's a complete sentence. And my family does it too. I love my family to death, but they will do it too. They were like, oh, well, why don't you want to come to this thing? I just don't want to. <laughs> like, I don't owe you an explanation. No, you know, before I would try to come up with a, a good excuse that way they could get off my back. And now I'm like, I just don't want to. I don't want to drive to, I don't want to drive to wherever you are. You know, I don't really know this person like that. Like it, it's, but I think as Americans, we have been trained to almost manipulate each other like that. Like to, when someone says to us, no, I can't do it or no, I don't want to do it. We've almost been trained to manipulate each other and say, well, it's going to be really a lot of fun or, you know, well, it's going to be great. Or this is the reason why you want to do this. And I don't understand Look, I, this is what I see with Tui. Tui doesn't, I see this in Tui in that he's the greatest manipulator in this book and that he can A, convince people that it's their own idea. Um, B, he can talk you into doing anything and making you think it's for your own good. But the thing that I thought was... Uh, was most telling of Tui when he really confessed it is when he was with the police officer on the street. And he said, he said, basically, you know, you should arrest me. And the police officer laughed him off. He's so unassuming. Um, and then when Peter Keating is with him and he's laying down and Peter Keating really sees how frail he is because he sees the ankle with the pajama pants and the slipper. And I thought, you know, I was like, when is he, like, I was, I was almost hoping that Peter Keating would really see Tui for who he is. And I think he started to, but he could not, 
he, he could not admit that he had been manipulated this whole time and that it was so easy to do. And so that was one thing. And then another thing um, was uh, when we were talking about redemption and, you know, I think Anne Rand was making the point that not that Gail Wine couldn't be redeemed, is that it's really hard because when you've been doing one thing all your life and you've, you've set up, he set up the banner to be a, 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 a rag, right? You know, a gossip rag, trash magazine. And he knew exactly what he was doing and he knew exactly what he was doing to people. And now he's going to try and redeem himself and redeem the banner. You got years and years and years of a reputation that you have to overcome. So I, I think what Rand was saying is that you can do it, but the key is you have to be true to who you are, not to who you show people who you are. Because sometimes like we show people who we are and then we realize that we have changed and that's not who we want to be anymore. And that's fine. I think that's the beauty of America. You could create yourself to who you want to be. But you got to understand that people are going to see you as you were and that you're going to have to keep going with who you are, no matter what people are saying. And you're going to have to keep explaining. Yes, that's true. That is who I was. You're going to have to own up to a lot. You're going to have to really, you know, be open and vulnerable. But if you're truly dedicated to redemption and changing who you are or becoming who you want to be, you're going to have to go through that. There is just no shortcut. So um, the last part is that I wrote down um, is that work, like Howard likes the work that he does, or he, not to say that he likes it. Well, he likes the work that he does in terms of, like he said, he was thinking of the Cortland building for a while because he liked that type of work. But he accepts that because I like this work, there may be some things I don't want to do that he has to do. And then there's things that he could just say, hey, Peter, you know what you're good at, do this part. And I think Keating doesn't like his work at all. And I think when they were talking, I think it was Elder Stewie who was talking to Peter and he was saying the part about, you never really built your own buildings or I don't know if it was Tui, but I think he was like, you don't, you, you never built your own buildings. You never did any of your own work, basically. It's like you, you were you were a second hand or you were a parasite you leaned on others work and you, you know and that's how you got ahead that's why peter keating doesn't like to do the work because he's not working on what he ever wanted to he wanted to be an artist he wanted that and if you know if he had listened to himself he could have been and i think that's the saddest part about Ke peter keating and i think I used to work in the financial industry. I used to work in insurance and I would see, I guess I have like sympathy for Peter Keating. I, I guess I'm like how it worked. I kind of feel pity for the guy because I've seen Peter Keating's story in insurance brokers who come in and whose dads and moms tell them, this is who you're going to be. You're going to go to college. You're going to go do an internship at this because we had a lot of them. We used to call them, um, golden children and the reason why we call them the golden children is because they didn't have to earn a thing to get into the firm they just got in because of who their parents were but they never had the opportunity to be who they wanted to be and so I guess I have a soft spot in a sense for Peter Keeney because he was kind of groomed at a very young age of to what he was going to do so did he ever receive the opportunity? And I think that's the contrast. Sorry, one more line going back to that is um, I was one of, it was at the party with Tui. It was one of the rich people who said, is it our fault that we weren't, they were talking about Gail Wyatt and they were like, is it our fault that we weren't born in Hell's Kitchen? You know, and, it, and in a sense, if you're not born of wealth, you don't have that restriction on you you know you can kind of become who you want to be without having to answer to anybody because especially in Gail Wyan's case and I guess in Howard Works case as well you don't owe anybody anything because you don't really have anybody 
so you can kind of become who you want to be. And these people who are born rich, even though it sounds like a privileged statement, in a sense, you get the sense that they're kind of bitter about it. They're kind of locked in. They're, they they can't really self-realize who they want to be, even though they have all the money and all the, they don't have the ability to decide. They were never raised that way. So that's what I got out of it. But thank you, everyone. Wonderful. Evanique, that, that's amazing set of comments. And I it's really amazing. You know, it's like, this is a book that I'm intimately familiar with. So it is really wonderful to see you discover some of these themes on your own. So really appreciate that. And it's like the way in which you come at it is very authentic and it is based on your own experience. So it's just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, next up is going to be Joe followed by Maritza. Joe. Yeah, I mean, it was a great presentation by the panelists. Again, uh, I really enjoyed everybody's uh, contributions. I missed Rob's, unfortunately. I was running a little bit late, but um, I'm sure it was excellent. Um, you know, one of the, I think one of the most interesting things for me uh, is some of the points that actually Rapali had hit on uh, with this idea of dogmatic thinking uh, and having a growth mindset uh, and how that sticks out uh, mostly, I I'd imagine it's in chapter 11. Uh, so essentially where they, um, uh, you know, they talk about uh, the deadliness of secondhanders uh, and essentially the, the concern that they have no, they have no concerns for ideas, facts, or work. And the idea that they, I think work says it's opinion without a rational process at one point, you know, essentially is what a person is without an ego. And that's a very important thing is that when you don't have a rational process, you can kind of see the process of becoming the inverted self in that, in that process. Because if you're, you have this belief of the world, this dogmatic thinking, and this is the way you're going to view the world, that leads to a form of confirmation bias. So then what is confirmation bias? Confirmation bias by nature is irrational because you're actually seeking for what you only believe in that process. So when you go out and that's how you're seeking for looking for the world and, and actually uh, Rapali used this as one of her students, uh, for one of her students as well. Um, uh, one of the, uh, uh, what was the first picture that you held up is the idea of seeking truth. And then when you stop seeking truth, then you're really not intentional anymore. You're no longer, you're no longer moving in. You may, it may be intentional, but it's someone else's intentions um, because you actually have a fixed mindset on how the world looks to you. So I think that that's really a practical way of looking at this because in there it has a lot of effects to how you look at you do job, how you look at medicine, how do you look at law, how do you look at these other areas? And it's, it has consequences because then what, how, where's the creative process go? There is no creative process. So when you, when you start to um, uh, take this, you know, take this irrational approach, having opinions without a rational, without a rational way of thinking, that it kind of turns you in on yourself and allows you to just, unfortunately, uh, no longer, uh, um, you know, no longer seek for what you, who you are or what you truly want to do and how you want to act in the world. Uh, so, um, yeah, and dogmatic thinking, I feel like actually does that. It takes the ability to really, um, to find yourself in, in this world, like kind of, and, and you only have one way of looking at it and it's completely relaxed, rational thinking. Anyway, that's one of the main thoughts, that, takeaways that I had from this part. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Next up is Maritza. Um, so a few things. I, I, the, the first, um, so I, some of the things that Evanique said came to mind for me, you know, you were talking about the, um, the church you no longer go to. So I am a product of Catholic school upbringing. And uh, I used to think that I was quite prestigious. I always have delusions that I'm like far funnier than I actually am. 
So um, I, I used to amuse myself by telling people, um, I would love to believe in God, but I have thoughts. And um, everyone always looked at me all kinds of weird. And, you know, I used to just chuckle and keep on going like I hadn't realized that I was awkward. Um, but the, so, you know, I'm a little older now. I, I, I probably don't say that as often, but the, but I understand more what I was saying and why I was saying that. And um, I, I feel like what Evanique described is kind of what, what I was thinking and feeling is that I found myself in an environment where I, it was not okay to question the, um, and, and Joe was just touching upon this also that it becomes dogmatic. You know, they want you to believe in these things um, blindly without questioning. And, you know, I, I am, I am that precocious child that, you know, you get sick of hearing the million and four whys. I will say that I am the super cool aunt because I have never gotten a why thrown at me amongst my 22 nieces and nephews that I did not answer. And my youngest niece right now is 19. But I, I was the one that their mom would call and go, she has questions because I never met a why that I didn't talk through with them because I just, that just because to me, I never understood it, but I digress. The, you know, this, you know, so that the idea of blind faith in anything, I see that threaded throughout the caution that, that Ayn Rand is showing us here as she's feeding us her philosophy woven into this story it's the, you know, it's because you're not thinking. It's, it's again, if you're accepting everything that the church tells you just because it's the church and you're giving them this, you know, blanket authority or even giving them um, the, uh, or, or even giving them, like, you know, you're giving them the absolute authority. That's just, that's no good. And it, it, um, it reminds me of, you know, the, the quote that I said a bunch of times, and yes, guys, I am shamelessly going to say it one more time. <laughs> to suspend consciousness is to stop life, right? And so if we're, to, and, and, the, and the sentence that precedes that, Rob had read to us too, and it's the, when you suspend your faculty of independent judgment, you suspend consciousness. If you're not questioning all these things that are fed to you, well, you're not in, you're not exercising your independent judgment. And what it comes to mind for me is again, that the, when we're on a plane and they're telling you all the procedures to do to get ready for a plane to be safe, they always say in the event of a change in pressure or oxygen, oxygen masks will fall down from the overhead compartment. First, if you're traveling with young children, first place your mask securely and then put on that of your child's. And that seems counterintuitive to our society where we're like, oh gosh, you're gonna run the risk of letting the child die. But here's the thing, why is this important? Because if you pass out, the child is surely dead because you are the caretaker for the child. So what must one do when one has the responsibility so imminent to another? take care of the eye. The failure to first grab onto that inner eye is sure destruction of anything that you're responsible for or anything near to you. That's, it's that example, the idea of first put your mask on because then you're in a good position to put on the mask of your child. Um, and and I, I have, so that, that comes to mind and I, I forget, what it is you were saying, Avonique, sorry, but that came to mind again um, for me um, in that, um, in, in some of what you were talking about, the interplay uh, for Keating and how he's a, you know, kind of a pitiful um, creature. I don't feel a lot of pity for him because to me, he is a character who went left perpetually when he had the option to go right. He had the option and, and he saw it and still went the other way. So, so he's a little bit more, um, to me, I feel like, you know, I don't know if there's pity. Um, and Wynan is similar. Wynan willfully went this way. Um, and so they're, they're, we're going to see how it plays out for them in different ways, but the error that they made was the same. It, it was that 
refusal or lack of acknowledgement that they needed to be true to themselves. They needed to, with intention, move forward and they didn't. So then now we're gonna see how that plays out. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Maritza. I wanted to make one comment about Evanique's comment about um, Golden Kids, Joe's comment about second-handers, and Evanique's comment about how the church behaves. Because I think there is a common pattern to it. It is inversion of form and function. It's people who grab on to the forms that are produced by earlier functions and live, try to live by them and consider that to be a substitute for function itself, like wealth. And this is not just, you know, golden kids this time, there's like this entire gilded age where people, there are people who actually produce the wealth and then there were people who were who inherited that health, uh, wealth. Um, so it is all about that. And you're trying to hold on to that and use that it gives you the forms actually were living forms when they are produced. It gives you a great deal of benefit to have those forms. But if you just had those forms and try to hold on to them, you will just lose them. You will lose them and you will lose everything uh, in, in you. So, um, all right, uh, let me see. Uh, Sherry and Rob, do you have, uh, do you wanna make any comments before you leave? Not just perfect. just that this was great. I yeah. loved everybody's presentations. Really enjoyed it. Um, and I'm sorry, I just I have a client meeting. <laughs> of course. All right. See you folks. Sorry, I sorry. Bye, everybody. We'll see you next week. See you next right. week. Bye. 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 So Bye. yeah, so I, I see that that pattern of reversal everywhere, even in church. Like the whole, if you look at the gospel of John, it is all about this living fountain in your heart. That's what the whole thing is about. Whereas they are saying, no, 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 that's not important. This, we are the intermediaries. We will show you what that is. Um, or, you know, just uh, so at, at every level of saying, or, or architectural forms saying, okay, these are the architectural forms, which is already the right form. So why you just take them? So the reversal of form and function, I think, uh, explains a lot. All right, folks. So thank you. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. And thanks, Maritza, for doing the moderating while I was gone. And we'll see you next time. They mostly week. moderated themselves. Yes, these are these are very well-behaved <laughs> well, people. Very, yeah. very much so. <laughs> <laughs> but I always like to leave a moderator behind, you know, just, just you in don't case. Know. All, right. All right. See you, folks. Bye. 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 Bye.